All right, Mr. Chairman, we're recording and ready to call to order. All right, all right. This is Tom Riggs. I'm participating uh, remotely tonight. Uh, good evening. It's 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday, September 15th, 2020. And this regular meeting of the Sandpoint Planning Commission, Planning and Zoning Commission is now called to order. Um, because I can't see everyone and I'm not positive who's remote, who's not, I think I will call the roll individually. And if you could state where you are participating from, I'd appreciate it. So I'll start with the uh, Commissioner Huseman. Uh, present participating remotely. Thank you. John Hastings. Present in person. Uh, Walker. Present in person. Mr. Camp. Present in person. And Commissioner Shook. Present remote. And um, Commissioner Dunkel. Present in person. Thank you, and I'm Tom Riggs, chairperson, and I am present remotely. <clears throat> um, are there any general announcements or reports from the commissioners? Hearing none, are there any members of the public who wish to address the commission on a general matter other than this evening's public hearing? And again, hearing none, we will move on to the meeting minutes approval. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the meeting minutes from the commission's last meeting of July 7th, 2020. I, if, there, if there are any questions, <clears throat> we can, questions or comments, we can deal with those now, now or is there, um, if not, we'll entertain a motion. No questions or comments? Is there a motion to approve the, uh, the uh, minutes? Motion to approve oh. is presented. I'm hearing a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second. <laughs> and Melissa, did you get the identity of the, the person making the motion? I believe that was uh, Commissioner Shook uh, made that motion and Commissioner Hastings uh, the second. Okay, great. Um, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. 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 Are there any nays? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Um, there, the next item on the agenda is old business, but I don't believe we have any old business. Um, would that be correct, Aaron? That's correct, Mr. Chair. All righty. We'll move on to new business. Um, the new business item on the agenda is a public hearing and subsequent decision for preliminary approval of the University Park subdivision proposed for development on two parcels, totaling approximately uh, 75 acres, bounded by East Mountain View Drive to the north North Boyer Avenue to the west, Sand Creek and Fifth Avenue to the east, and the BNSF railroad tracks to the south. A notice of public hearing was published in the Bonner Daily Bee on August 22, 2020. I'll run through the order and procedure for the hearing here quickly. Uh, first, there will be an explanation of the subject of the hearing by the city staff, then a presentation by the applicant, um, commissioner should address any, any questions of the applicant to the applicant at that time, at this time. After the applicant, applicant's um, presentation will open the public hearing at which time the public may provide testimony. Questions should be asked of the person testifying before leaving the podium. Those wishing to testify are required to uh, complete a sign-up sheet, which will be provided by the city, should be on the table up near the city clerk. Uh, those participating remotely have registered prior to the meeting. The order for providing testimony will be as follows. Um, those um, after the applicant, those in favor of the application will be asked to testify. Those who are neutral, second. 
And then thirdly, those who are opposed to the application. Following that testimony, the, there will be a rebuttal testimony from the applicant, if any, at which time final questions may be asked of the applicant. If any new factor elicited, elicited during rebuttal, the public will be given an opportunity, opportunity to comment on those new facts. And then at that point, I will close the hearing, the commission will deliberate, and during deliberations, no new information may be provided. Uh, questions may be directed only to city staff during deliberation. Um, so with that, I'll turn to you, Aaron, for your presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Before we get started, can I ask um, uh, if you wouldn't mind if any commissioner has had any ex parte contact or conflict or has any conf uh, conflicts of interest with regards to this quasi-judicial matter, quasi-judicial meaning judge-like, which you're all uh, acting in capacity of tonight. And so we want to make sure ex parte contact, of course, as if you've had any discussions with anyone um, outside of these proceedings that you may be privy to information uh, that others are not. And then a conflict of interest would be a direct financial benefit uh, to you or immediate family member um, as a result of approval or denial of this application. None. 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 This is uh, for sure. In the past, I have had business dealings with uh, the applicant and in the future, you know, due to the nature of my business and that relationship, I may benefit in some way at some point from uh, the product of this application, if that matters. To abstain. Uh, Commissioner Shuck, uh, at the advice of counsel, you should abstain from voting in tonight's proceedings. Very good. Thank you. Now, I, I, I have a, I have a question. Should should uh, Commissioner Shook also um, refrain from participating in the hearing? In the way, of, in the way of asking questions and the like. Yes. Okay. All right, Aaron, you ready to proceed? Yes. Uh, first, I'm going to share my screen. I have a uh, hopefully brief presentation. Um, and first, I wanted to kind of give introductions to uh, uh, city staff and consultants present this evening. Uh, I'm Aaron Qualls, Planning and Community Development Director. Um, to my left here is Fonda Jovic, our city land use attorney. Um, Ryan Shea, associate planner, uh, is over there. And um, Dan Taddock is our city engineer. Of course, we have our uh, city clerk, um, Melissa, uh, running the show for us tonight. And then as uh, for city consultants, uh, we've been working with Phil Cushlin, uh, principal with Cushlin and Associates, uh, planning and management consulting firm. Uh, this is not the first time the city's worked with Phil. He was actually involved in previous planning efforts for this particular area. Um, uh, if some of you may recall, we've done some uh, previous planning efforts around the U of I property and Phil uh, helped us navigate through part of that. He has 21 years direct experience consulting with Idaho cities, experiencing significant growth pressures. He's a former executive director of Boise Capital City Development Corp. Uh, corporation and he's been a city manager for small and large cities for over 26 years. So we're very happy to have him on board through this. His role is to evaluate, negotiate uh, draft conditions um, and a development agreement uh, and serve as the city liaison to the applicant. Uh, and then, uh, and I will turn uh, some of these, um, I, will, I will turn a portion of the presentation over to him as well as Preston Stinger, a, a Idaho licensed engineer with Fair and Peers. Karen Piers is the traffic consulting firm that the city has engaged with, along with OTAC, for our uh, multimodal transportation plan. And his role is to evaluate and make recommendations regarding the traffic impact analysis and any traffic mitigations. So with that, I will uh, kind of go over it briefly, the documents that have been provided. Uh, as typical in a staff report, we have the, an overview, an analysis, uh, relative to the comprehensive plan. Uh, we have included potential conditions, development requirements, uh, public hearing procedure, which uh, Chairman Riggs, you went over earlier, and then uh, pro motion for proposed subdivision recommendation 
uh, should you choose to forward this on to city council. Uh, we have a lot of attachments for tonight's hearing, uh, but although this project is larger in scale than you may have dealt with in the past, the process is exactly the same. Um, we have the application supporting documents, uh, preliminary plat, and a phasing plan phased over four phases uh, per the applicant narr narrative and the uh, uh, preliminary, preliminary plat um, documents. Uh, a preliminary traffic impact analysis, and then a final submittal, and then an evaluation memo from Fair and Peers. Stormwater wetland documents, preliminary utility plans, public hearing notices, of course, and all written comments received. Now we had some late uh, submissions, and we posted them somewhat late. Uh, we have two, we have three attachments in total up on the city website for comments received. Uh, attachment 9, attachment 9A, and attachment 9B. And I wanted to ask and make sure that you've all had a chance to read uh, all of those comments. We've printed them out for you as well. And if you want to take time to uh, look at those, that's certainly understandable. There's been a lot of, like I said, comments rece uh, received um, uh, as of today, and we want to make sure everyone's voices are heard. Has everyone had a chance to review all the comments submitted? I, re I have reviewed them, Aaron. I have also. Excellent, thank you. Um, as a little different, we have also provided a draft development agreement. Now typically a, a development agreement is more the purview of council, but we wanted to give you a complete picture and kind of show you, you know, the uh, it, it provide as much information as we can uh, for this application. However, it's really the conditions portion that is also uh, as part of the staff report that is really what you'll be evaluating against tonight. Other areas of the development agreement are really the purview of the city council. If there's no questions, I'll kind of move on and just kind of give an overview. Or drink of water. Uh, this is the former Sandpoint University of Idaho Research and Extension Center, 70, approximately 75 acres in total. Uh, the State Board of Education approved the sale in 2019 and is now owned by the applicants, Tim McDonald, Came Enterprises of Idaho, LLC, and Derek Mulgrew, uh, and apologies if I have not pronounced that quite correctly. Um, what's that? Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, M and W Holdings, LLC. Currently, the site is predominantly zoned single family residential. Um, uh, the parcel or the part of the existing parcel to the east, east of the Union Pacific Railroad tracks and basically north of Highway 2 uh, is zoned commercial B. Um, so zoning, of course, is the uh, law of the land in place right now to which this uh, of which the standards uh, or apply for which you'll be judging this subdivision application against. Uh, the future land use map is uh, a part of our comprehensive plan, which is a vision for the future of this property. And, it, and the future vision of this property is a mix of open space, a mix of housing types, and uh, some commercial as well. Um, I've overlaid the uh, uh, subdivision preliminary plot layout here uh, on the on the aerial and also included as part of the um, part of the traffic impact analysis is a vision for some of those future uses. Now I want to be clear that the traffic impact analysis contemplates uh, multifamily as well as commercial primarily to the south. However, you are not deciding on future uses tonight merely on the subdivision application under current zoning standards. Uh, phase, uh, pr primarily what's uh, been termed as phase four, uh, for any rezoning to allow for multifamily development or commercial would have to come back to you at a subsequent rezoning and subdivision application. The purpose uh, for the future site plan and the traffic impact analysis is to um, get ahead of what all traffic impacts may be. So tonight you have essentially two options. Uh, you can forward on uh, this subdivision with a recommendation to the city council, 
or you can uh, um, you can essentially table the decision uh, and take it up at your next meeting. If you do choose to um, withhold making a decision tonight, and close the public hearing. It's important to note that you cannot have any uh, conversations with anyone except for city staff and staff consultants uh, between that period of when you take it up again. Just so everyone's aware, city council makes the final decision and they have three options. One is to concur with your recommendation. They may deny the application or they may also postpone and consult with you and staff um, and um, reach a decision after that. So um, we do need reasoned decisions for forwarding on a recommendation and ultimately for approval of subdivision applications. And that brings me to a couple of things that um, are points of discussion uh, where we want reasons, reasoned uh, findings of fact um, and, uh, for forwarding this on or not. One is block lengths. Um, most of the blocks within the subdivision are, meet our standard of between 300 and 600 feet. However, block one um, it shows a block length of approximately 2,000 square feet. And should you grant, um, uh, should you forward this on with a variance to this standard in accordance with uh, Sandpoint City Code 1018B, um, we would want uh, reason findings and we can, and we'll have both the applicant engineer, our, our city engineer and our consultants engineers to speak to this. We do have a uh, draft condition uh, for breaking up the block with a 12 foot pedestrian path. And then the other block length, oh, sorry. Uh, and then the other one is double frontage lots. Uh, double frontage lots are those lots that have streets on uh, both sides and both, both the frontage and the back. Um, they're typically prohibited except um, in areas where there's unusual topography and where integrated street plan or other conditions make it undesirable to meet this prohibition. Um, with regards, and I'll let the engineer speak in more detail to this, but uh, North Lawyer is an arterial three. Um, so directing um, uh, driveways onto North Boyer uh, may um, be a condition that may make that particular in this particular situation undesirable. Um, there is another area where um, double frontage lots are proposed and that is on Mountain View, in particular lots one through five of lot two I'm shown against Mountain View there. Um, now, and I'll let the engineers speak to this more, but it's a point of discussion. Um, the impact analysis considers Mountain View a local road. However, our transportation consultants in a memo uh, attached and included in the packet uh, considers uh, Mountain View to be more of a collector. And in the case of a collector, you do want driveways spaced according to the urban area transportation plan of 150 feet. So those are things to uh, ask about with our engineers and our consultants on staff. And with that, I will turn it over to Phil Cushlin, who can speak in more detail to the proposed conditions. Um, and uh, also Dan Taddock, our city engineer, regarding the traffic mitigation recommendations, unless you have any further questions for me at this point. Karen, would you mind going back to the plot map for the property? Could you just identify in there with your cursor what the two blocks are that exceed the maximum length? Maximum length. Two blocks. So Six the two points. blocks, the, the maximum length would be block one. And that's 2,000 feet. And then I think this is block three. Okay. Uh, this one certainly is limited by side street development, which I kind of sp spoke to in the staff report, right? Where you have steep slopes and sand creek um, block one um, i will defer to our city engineer okay. 
Okay, are you ready for my uh, comments at this point, uh, Mr. Chairman? So. Chairman Riggs? Yes. Ready to move on. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioners. Um, also, uh, with me here this evening are um, uh, representatives of uh, Fair Peers, who's the uh, city's uh, traffic engineering uh, consultant. Um, apparently, they've been doing work with you for over a year, and um, issues regarding the specifics of this proposal were forwarded to them uh, for their analysis as well. And as we get down uh, to the details of uh, the transportation uh, issues, I will turn that over to uh, uh, Preston uh, and, uh, and Chris to go over the details uh, in support of, of Dan's work on this as well. So <clears throat> again, um, as uh, indicated, I've been kind of retained by the city to kind of be a process steward here and kind of help uh, move the issues along and work out some of the uh, details of a, a project that is uh, certainly larger in scale than uh, that which the city has dealt with in the past. And, uh, and given the uh, traffic impacts, it has some probably unique issues that um, were of some concern to, to us and we needed some assistance in, in working through the details of that. So uh, we'll try to give you as much information on that as we can, but as we conclude our comments, we'll be happy to stand for any questions that the commission might have. Um, as you've seen in your packet <clears throat> in the staff report, there are 15 uh, separate conditions. Um, uh, the first one is basically uh, indicates that uh, all the current requirements uh, uh, will be uh, applied or that are in place at the time of permit applications. Again, the uh, uh, proposal is for uh, four phases. Um, we're assuming that uh, market conditions will allow them to move along rapidly, but uh, sometimes uh, things don't work out in the time frame that uh, we didn't envision, so maybe a, a future phase might lag. And if, if processes and uh, requirements of the city changes in that interim period, uh, the uh, requirements at that particular time would become uh, uh, applicable. Uh, <clears throat> there's a requirement across uh, a couple of lots over on the east side of the um, of the subdivision that calls for uh, utility easement access. There's uh, anticipated to be a sewer line through there and uh, uh, like to use that for access for utility maintenance, uh, potentially emergency uh, access if uh, that works out, and also uh, a minimum of a 12 foot uh, pedestrian path across that area to accommodate pedestrian movements uh, through there. Uh, we'll assume that uh, that uh, access is uh, either gated off or has bollards to ensure that uh, people don't use it as a cut through um, opportunity to get to one part of the subdivision to the other. Uh, again, as Aaron talked about, uh, there's a requirement here for a publicly dedicated pedestrian easement, uh, again, a minimum 12 feet, uh, that would uh, provide a connection between uh, North Boyer and Bluegrass Avenue. Again, that breaks up that uh, very long um, frontage along North Boyer and gives uh, certainly pedestrians an opportunity to, to make a cut through that uh, uh, vehicles uh, uh, you didn't have the vehicles having another access on the North Boyer, but certainly would connect with your multi-use path on North Boyer for pedestrians and, and cyclists. Um, <clears throat> we want to make sure that uh, all the stormwater conveyance systems are maintained in perpetuity. And uh, at some point as the developer moves on and um, so a structure is created uh, in the subdivision through uh, homeowner association or a similar situation to ensure that maintenance of those uh, systems are uh, maintained by the property owners at that time. Um, certainly we want them to maintain compliance with uh, EPA uh, construction permit regulations throughout the development so we don't have uh, water quality issues off-site. Um, uh, impact fees uh, as per your uh, ordinance will be required prior to the issues of uh, building permits, and again, at the rate adopted by the City Council at the time of its issuance. Um, 
uh, in the event for some unforeseeable reason, the final plat is not realized, um, we'd require a 30 foot uh, wide utility easement, which would allow access to the city to maintain those pieces of the public infrastructure that were in fact completed. We assume that will not be necessary, but in case uh, that were to occur, we'd need our ability to maintain. Okay, Aaron, can we move to the next one? Thank you. Um, I think here we're gonna get into uh, some of the issues with respect to uh, requirements <coughs> of the um, offsite improvements, basically to North Boyer Avenue and uh, East Mountain View Road. Um, and also a discussion, I think, of the uh, uh, fair share or prorated uh, cost of some of the identified improvements offsite in the uh, in the development or outside the development. So, uh, with that, I would uh, turn to Dan and uh, uh, and the Fair Pierce uh, people to uh, go through the, the analysis that they did and uh, discuss with you briefly what their findings have been. So Dan, you want to pick it up? Yeah, all right. Sure. Thank, thank you, Phil. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Preston, uh, I'm just going to touch touch base real quickly, and then I got a couple uh, things I'll turn over to you as well. Um, just want to inform the commission a little bit about the background here. Um, the urban area transportation plan was adopted by city council back in 2009. Appendix H of that document provides a process for reviewing traffic impacts associated with developments. Uh, consistent with other developments, we sent the other recent uh, proposed developments, uh, we've sent the, that submittal packet to this independent transportation engineer, Fair and Pierce, Preston and Chris, who are on with us today, who provided a completeness and compliance review. Um, we also asked that they verify some of the modeling and uh, recommendations from the traffic impact analysis. Um, with that, I, I have a couple um, questions, I guess, I'd like to uh, turn over to Preston. And, and Preston, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on these one by one and let you provide a response. These are uh, perhaps questions that might be uh, on the minds of the commission or, or have come up from uh, uh, agencies as well. Um, the first one, Preston, is uh, could you address the ITD comments regarding the timing of the traffic counts? Sure, Dan. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Preston. Uh, so, Dan, to your question about the ITD comments regarding when the traffic counts were done, I, I know their concern was wanting to make sure that these counts were not done during uh, some of the COVID shutdowns when that began, where traffic volumes would be decreased most likely in a lot of areas during many of these past months. Um, <laughs> the traffic study uh, states that the counts were collected in October 2019 and November 2019, the 2nd of October and 7th, uh, respectively. And then they did additional counts uh, for winter seasonal in March, on March 10th, which is just before COVID kind of spread and before there was a lot of shutdowns. And then they did some additional counts on that next Saturday of that same week on the 14th which is just after things started to um, kind of hit across the nation, but before there was a lot of shutdowns and, and shelter in place kind of demands. So um, we believe that their counts are reasonable and within a time frame that uh, should be consistent with regular traffic volumes. Great, thank you, Preston. Um, second question is regarding um, why the proposed conditions provide a fair share cost at the Boyer and Baldy intersection that are different than uh, what was proposed in the traffic impact analysis completed by the uh, applicant. Sure, so the, the applicant did their fair share calculations based on a method that is not um, concurrent with the guidelines in the UATP and uh, when we reviewed that, we, we used the calculations out of the UATP, uh, which is basically taking your, your project trip volumes divided by your total traffic volumes of the intersection. And that percentage is the fair share. And that's how it's outlined in the UATP. So that's, it's just different calculations than what the applicant used. 
And, and those numbers, if, if I'm not mistaken, were 17% uh, and change uh, to 21% and change. Does that sound accurate? That is, yep. Um, and the, the last question I have for you, Preston, is uh, can, you, can you help address or explain why the proposed conditions um, provided for uh, improvements in fair share costs shared by the applicant at the intersection of Highway 2 and Larch, whereas the applicant's traffic impact analysis did not address that intersection? Well, I can't speak to why the applicant didn't address that, but I can speak to why we believe it is important that it, it, the applicant does address their fair share at that intersection. That, that intersection is already um, struggling in terms of how it functions from a, a level service standpoint. Um, it's below your threshold uh, that you would like to see your intersections at. Um, so even though it's at a, what we call a level service F, if you think about it on the letter grade, A being great, F being poor, um, it's functioning that, in that level service F grade area. And that's today without the project on top of it. So the, the project with its additional traffic does worsen that condition. Um, and not by a not by a substantial amount, but some. And so we, even though it's already at a poor condition, the project does add to its even more poor condition, adding some more delay. So they are impacting that to a lesser amount than many other intersections. And as a result, their fair share is is much lower. It's in that 2.45 percent range. So it's it's low, but uh, I believe it would be in the best interest of the city to to get their fair share there. Okay, and I believe I misspoke, Preston, when I said they didn't address that intersection. They did, they just found that it to be at an acceptable level of service, even in the future conditions. That's right, and I think that was just a, I can't speak exactly for the applicant, but I think I was just misspoken in the TIS because it's, the results in their appendix show that it is indeed in a failing condition. Okay, thank you, Preston. Sure. Anything else uh, wanted me to walk through here? Bill, do you have anything to add or do the, does the commission have any questions for either uh, Phil or Preston or Dan? Fonda, Ryan, Melissa. If you there are no questions on transportation, uh, there are a couple more um, conditions after transportation that I'd highlight quickly. Um, uh, one is that uh, dealing with the capacity of the existing sewer lift station. Uh, we believe that there's um, sufficient capacity uh, to handle the, um, the discharge of the, of the subdivision, but uh, we want to make sure that uh, that is demonstrated in some manner that uh, the state will accept. Um, Certainly, uh, we need to have compliance with uh, all wetland requirements since there are uh, designated wetlands uh, on the site and um, they should um, uh, prior to the issuance of uh, construction impacting wetlands, uh, they shall provide evidence for authorization uh, by the Corps of Engineers uh, to proceed and demonstrate a Receive for the payment of any required uh, wetland credits. Um, I think uh, also uh, there's some issues with regard to the specific design of the widening of North Boyer. Um, I think um, clearly um, it's a um, uh, arterial three designation on Boyer. Um, there's an interest in widening that to provide uh, some left turn. Uh, capacity there in the middle and sorry, in the south end, uh, right turn capacity uh, into the new subdivision. And then uh, there's some engineering details on Mountain View with regard to a turn line, a turn lane that uh, is um, requested to um, provide a, uh, a turn situation, protected turn uh, at North Boyer and to uh, hopefully to provide a uh, uh, an alternative to cut through traffic on Aspen. So those are the, the 15 um, uh, conditions. Uh, I guess I'd ask uh, Preston or Chris if they had anything to add on uh, the other transportation issues that I highlighted. 
but if not, uh, we're prepared to respond to whatever questions that you might have. Rest of you. Nothing to add on our side, Phil, unless there needs to be some more detail there. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yeah, I, I have a one question. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's going to be more discussion about the block length of, um, uh, I guess that would be bluegrass. And there's been a suggestion that we require a pedestrian easement uh, partway down bluegrass. Would it, would it also be a possibility instead of a pedestrian easement to have another vehicular access there? Would you take the street out to Boyer? at about the place where the pedestrian easement is suggested. Mr. Chair, if I may uh, chime in on that. This is Dan, city engineer. Sorry, you can't necessarily see me talking. Uh, but, I can uh, hear you. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, generally speaking, I'll certainly uh, let Preston respond as well, but generally speaking, uh, access is typically you want you want it to the lowest functional class street abutting the development so for example you would typically want a driveway accessing a local street you would typically want a local street accessing a collector and a collector then accessing an arterial um, essentially what the applicants show here with their development and and uh meets the, the general intent of that. Granted, they have uh, two accesses to Boyer, which is an arterial, uh, and they have two accesses to um, East Mountain View, which uh, based on our consultant recommendation with this development would probably function more as a collector. Um, we feel that uh, the proposal by the applicant breaking the, the accesses up in this manner is with good, uh, logic in terms of that general methodology I just discussed, but then also by providing that uh, pedestrian access easement, you are accommodating, you are breaking up that block, block length while not adding more vehicles to a situation along Boyer that is already um, uh, less than uh, ideal given the close proximity to the railroad tracks and having another access on an arterial, which is intended to move traffic. You typically want your arterials to be uninterrupted, you want that continuous flow of traffic. Uh, we feel another access there may not provide uh, or may have negative impacts given the close proximity of the railroad tracks. Uh, Preston, is there anything that I missed there or anything you'd like to add to that statement? I concur with everything you said there, Dan. Um, just give maybe a different perspective on it. It's the, the arterials, you think about it as an artery in your body, it's, it's the lifeblood of your roadway system. It's what's moving your traffic around your town. And we don't want to degrade that uh, as much as possible. Now, accesses are good because it distributes your traffic around to these different areas and doesn't focus it all in one area. So multiple accesses are, are good. We want to make sure we're putting those on the right roadways. And what the applicant has proposed, the two on Boyer and the two on Mountain View seem appropriate. And it, that's good distribution of traffic around the, to those areas and using the collector roads in Mountain View to, to help with that, collecting onto one location onto Boyer in addition to the other two accesses. And as you start, if you introduce more access points onto Boyer or any arterial, um, you, you introduce more conflict areas. And more conflict areas means you're degrading your capacity, your roadways, you're slowing traffic down even more so having more congestion and, and possibly introducing some safety issues with inherently there's more safety issues with just accesses in general because there's more conflicts, vehicle conflicts and pedestrian and vehicle conflicts. So it's not always bad to limit accesses, especially when it goes on to arterials. So for, from an engineering perspective, is it, do you think that the, the four access points to and Boyer two on Mountain View is sufficient for all of these um, residential lots? Uh, yeah, Chairman Riggs, I, I believe it is. It's looking at the traffic analysis that they did and, and what we reviewed and, and redid to some extent um, to validate it. There, there is sufficient capacity in those access points to, to handle their traffic load. All right, thanks.
Well, Aaron, you're um, you're still on. Is there any other questions uh, by the commission for any of city staff or our consultants at this point? I have a question on Mountain View Drive. And if we could go back to the plat and you could um, walk through the widening process or the suggested changes with your cursor, I would appreciate it. Yeah. And was it an image in that I previously showed that you want to see, or um, would you like me to bring up? Are you look thinking about the aerial photo, or yeah, on the aerial. But there was here. Yeah, that's fine. If you can just uh, make it a little bit bigger, so yeah, I can we can see it. Bit. Make it a little artifacted, but. If this is in the application, there is language about widening the road, but I think there's two numbers. I think there's 70, I think there's 42. Okay, so 70 is the total width of the right of way. I think currently it's at 60, approximately, depending. I, I think we're conflating East Boyer and, or excuse me, North Boyer and East Mountain View. Uh, 60 is the right of way for East Mountain View, and 70 right. is the right of way for Boyer. Right. Uh, yeah, so that the the recommendation in the or the proposed condition is for a approximately 42 feet between face to curb and face to curb between Boyer and Aspen Way. Um, you, 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 I will note that the traffic impact analysis and the uh, concurrence or the analysis uh, of those recommendations from uh, Fair and Peers did point out that based on level of service, a third lane is not uh, necessary based on level of service calculations. However, uh, you'll see in your staff uh, packet uh, some of the comments from neighbors, uh, and these were echoed by staff concerns when we discussed this internally as well. There's a concern that uh, Aspen Way may serve as a detour for vehicles leaving this development. If you can put yourself in the situation of somebody leaving this development onto East Mountain View Drive, um, and you see a, a, a queue of vehicles waiting to turn left onto Boyer. Uh, a level of service of D is acceptable according to uh, city council ordinance. However, a human response to that level of service may be to look for an alternate route. And we're, we want to make sure we're doing our best to mitigate that and not have the residents of Aspen Way and Juniper and the, the, that subdivision uh, basically have to deal with additional traffic that was never intended to go through there. While that's up, it would be beneficial to me, both when I was looking earlier at the plot and now as well, um, the names of some of these new streets, I'm not sure which streets we're talking about because it's so hard sure. to read. Um, you know, let me bring up a better document so that we can. So I'm going to bring up the phasing plan, which kind of gives an overview and I can kind of zoom in as needed. You can see that. Yeah. So of course, Mountain View is here. You can see my cursor okay. Yeah. This is North Boyer. At the new uh, street, this is South Aspen Way. Aspen Way is, the existing Aspen Way is to the north. Water Birch Way is this road here. South Sand Creek Lane is here. Um, Cattail Lane down here, if we go down. Bluegrass Lane Avenue goes all the way up here. Uh, and then we have University Parkway. Um, kind of one thing of note that uh, you know we have articulated, I think, in the draft development agreement. Nothing that you need to necessarily be concerned about is that uh, this road is also called South Creek Lane. We'll want we want all roads to be mutually exclusive from one another, and that's to support emergency service response. Um, so that will be a condition. One of these would have to change for that condition. 
Uh, and then Baylor Road um, is uh, um, towards the south, and then the most southern access point is uh, would be East Ebbett Way, and that would connect with the existing Ebbett Way to the west. I will say there was some confusion in some of the memos that because Google Google Maps thinks that's Culver's Drive and then Google Maps is wrong, <laughs> just in case anyone looked on Google. Uh, so this is Ebbett Way. Does that help? Yes. And so when we talk about two access points on Boyer, that would be at Baylor and East Emmett. That's correct. East Emmett Way here tapers up to a 65 foot width. And I think we, um, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, um, I think we've uh, considered a turn lane around here. Or that, that's, that would be on Boyer, I guess. Not yes, it was on Boyer. That is uh, proposed condition L. Uh, that was a uh, result of the Fair and Peers analysis uh, recommendation that uh, a northbound right turn lane on Boyer onto East Ebbett be provided. Um, and we set a date for that based on the development plan of, of 2025. And that actually would not be part of what we're well, moving on tonight. Well, that, that is a potential development condition. For the future, okay. Yes. So un, unlike the stoplights or the turn lanes on Large Street, this would be full cost borne by the developer, not a fair share. These, these turn lanes into the, into the development, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, as this is written, um, that is a condition of the development, uh, as is the uh, right-of-way improvements along uh, Boyer and East Mountain View. Aaron, if you're ready, I've got a couple of questions. Okay, we'll see if I'm ready. <laughs> in, um, in, in the staff report, there's a reference to private open space, I think over towards the, the creek. And I wonder what, what does that term mean? I think I will defer to the applicant in their presentation that was taken directly from the applicant's narrative. Okay. Um, and second question, will there be a homeowners association to maintain these various open spaces within this development? Um, not necessarily. We haven't proposed a condition for a homeowners association. It does not, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to, um, have to be through a homeowner association to, to maintain uh, certain common areas. It's just kind of, I think that depends on the nature uh, ultimately of the uses of those common areas and who has access. Mr. Well, Chairman, can I, uh, can I jump in? Uh, the draft development agreement does provide for um, the establishment of a homeowners association with the uh, establishment uh, documents being uh, supplied as one of the uh, addenda to the or attachments to the development agreement. So uh, if there's a different way to do that, uh, I suppose we could entertain it. But I think absent some other kind of long-term maintenance commitment, I think the homeowners association should be something we would expect. Thank you. Okay, thanks. That, you know, that, that answers my question. My, it, it satisfies my concern that there, there has to be some mechanism to main, maintain these spaces. Um, Chairman Riggs, I have a, a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, I think it's for uh, Preston Stinger, I'm not sure. Um, a number of the comments mentioned bicycle access, and you've talked about the traffic study and the number of vehicles, um, not so much about the bicycle path along Boyer and the one that turns nor uh, east on Mountain View and heads down to Popsicle Bridge. With those two 
entrances and uh, roads going into the development from there and the concern about what did you call it drive through people coming down Aspen way to access the area is has any thought been given to how that's going to affect cyclists who are you know are used to being able to just enjoy their bike down to popsicle bridge and are now going to have to deal with two potentially major cross streets Uh, Commissioner, I can I can start the answer to that, and if anyone else wants to jump in, I I have not seen details on the applicant's design drawings of the driveways to see how they're addressing that specifically, but how how that should be addressed is having you know highly visible crosswalks where that path is crossing those driveways, um, and it would function as a any other path or trail that would be crossing a roadway or driveway or intersection. Um, so, you know, the appropriate signage and striping on the roadway to make sure it's highly visible and, and bikes, pedestrians are seen crossing at that location. The, hey, Mr. The, Chair, if I may chime in. Oh, sorry, go. The public sorry, comments Katie. really just did not, they preferred to have more access off of Boyer and your discussion of why having more roads going to Boyer is not a good idea for automobiles makes a lot of sense. Um, it just seems to me like for people who are not driving, uh, we're gonna create a problem and that's maybe just what we're doing. I just wonder if any other, if, if anyone has pursued it any further. I, who else was gonna speak? Maybe he has something so this to is Dan, Yeah, I'm a commissioner, uh, chair. Um, our current uh, recommended width from face a curb, face a curb would accommodate two bike lanes. In addition, if you looked at that typical, and this is for, for, for Boyer and for uh, East Mountain View, uh, if you looked at that uh, typical section in our urban area transportation plan for an arterial three, which is what is envisioned for Boyer, that also includes a shared use path as currently exists up along the east side of Boyer Avenue. So um, while all the details haven't been worked out, is certain there will certainly be bicycle and pedestrian considerations in the final design. And uh, those would be, would there be considerations along uh, Mountain View as well as along Boyer? Yes, uh, recognizing that there is a current uh, bicycle path on East Mountain View, um, but bicycle considerations and pedestrian considerations would be taken into account for East Mountain View as well. And again, that 42 foot width provides ample opportunity for that turn lane for two way traffic, even for bike lanes. In this scenario, you can see that Aaron's pulled up. This is from the urban area transportation plan and uh, provides some justification for the 42 feet those lane widths are very ample. Those can be uh, skinnied up and provide a five foot bike lane on each side. Okay, I see what you mean. Okay, are, are there, uh, I think we're to the point of seeing if there are other questions for Aaron or the, the consultants before we move on to the applicant. Are there other questions? Not hearing any. Aaron, um, you, you think you were, were ready to move on? I think so. Okay. Uh, next, we'll call on the applicant. Um, as a reminder, commissioners should address their questions to the applicant at this time. And um, I think I see the applicant's representative standing at the podium. If you would introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Riggs. Uh, Jeremy Grimm, uh, owner of Whiskey Rock Planning. Can everyone hear me okay? Testing? Yes, no problems. Great, great. Um, thanks so much, Commissioner and uh, Planning Commission members. Um, we are really excited to have this application finally before you. It's been a very long process and uh, a lot of work has gone into this, a lot of time and effort and money to understand the impacts and design accordingly for this development. 
Um, at this point, I just uh, ask uh, Aaron to um, uh, do whatever he needs to do so you can see my presentation. <laughs> Is it, everyone seen it? Great. So um, again, Jeremy Grimm from Whiskey Rock, and I was the former planning and community development director for the city of Sandpoint from 2007 to 2015, for those of you who are uh, familiar with me. Um, you know, this is a really special site. I think uh, most of us are familiar with it, um, just anecdotally in the community. I know myself, I've spent many hours out there cross country skiing with my kids and uh, enjoying the generosity of the University of Idaho and the current landowner to let people utilize that property. Um, and as you know, this property has quite a history that I'm gonna go into in just a second. And if we could go to the uh, next slide there. Uh, I just wanna talk about uh, the order I'm gonna go through here. We're gonna talk about the history, um, sort of the plan for the site, uh, the phasing, the outcomes, and uh, address some comments and concerns related to uh, public and staff uh, feedback. Uh, next slide, please. As Aaron mentioned, uh, we're here for a preliminary plat and subdivision application. It's a discretionary review, uh, like all land use reviews. It's based on approval criteria found in Sandpoint and Idaho Code. As Aaron mentioned, it's a quasi-judicial review. Um, and of course, evidence is to be reviewed and considered and determined based on findings of facts that the criteria of Sandpoint City Code have been satisfied. I like to say a subdivision to some degree is like getting a driver's license. As long as you meet the standards and the criteria outlined by the city code and state code, um, you, you should be able to pass the, the licensing. Um, this has been a two-year planning process. Uh, it's being developed by a local developer, two local developers uh, who have uh, developed over nine subdivisions in the city of Sandpoint over the course of the last 25 years. Um, in total, uh, uh, one of the developers is a fourth generation uh, Sam Pointian, and uh, they both care uh, tremendously about this community and really saw the acquisition of this property as a way to uh, work with the needs of the community and meet the needs of the community. There are over 126 contractors and subcontractors who are gonna be involved in the construction and development of this uh, subdivision in the homes. And most importantly, when the, the owners uh, secured this property, uh, they really looked long and hard at the extensive and expensive uh, visioning that the city of Sandpoint created for this property in 2018, <clears throat> also known as the 2018 University of Idaho Master Plan. And if you're not familiar with it, there's a great copy on the city's website. It's quite lengthy and uh, it's a really great document that we've done our best to implement. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just, you know, quickly, 75 acres, more or less, currently zoned residential single family west of the railroad tracks and commercial B east of the railroad tracks. It's currently unplatted land. Comprehensive plan after it was amended in 2017 has now kind of diced this into a mixture of context area three, context area three B and context area four, which basically means um, fairly dense housing, um, more dense mixed with commercial uh, housing with commercial, and then finally um, fairly dense and intense uh, commercial use. The proposal is broken out into four phases, totaling 152 lots. The largest developable lot uh, in phase is, occurs in phase four, and that's 6.1 acres. That's on the southern portion of the property. The smallest developable lot is 5,100 square feet just a hair above the minimum lot size for the residential single family zone. In total, there are 51 lots, less than 6,500 square feet, which uh, was really the target here for affordable housing. Um, some of you may know back in 2007, the city did a study of South Sandpoint and the most desirable lots in the community were between five and 6,000 square feet, according to that, um, that study that we did. Uh, there's a mixture of other lots per the comprehensive plan and the vision of the city ranging from about 6,500 to 9,000 square feet. So they've really worked hard to make that mixture work. Um, and most importantly, there are 16 acres of proposed uh, conservation open space that will have public access uh, on the property. The time frame for development is 2020 to 2025. Next slide, please.
Uh, the zoning on the site, uh, you're probably all aware, but residential single family to the north, got some uh, industrial technology technological park to the west that may have been changed recently um, residential multifamily to the west and then uh, we've got industrial business park to the south and then commercial B to the east next slide please a little history here um, I was kind of surprised to hear that this is the most intense and largest development that the city's dealt with um, it's far from it um, um, and I'll go through some of the history on the site. Of course, many of you know, um, the site was the University of Idaho's Agricultural Research Station. It's been ex in existence in its current location since 1912 and primarily focused on in its latter years uh, to cultivate domestic huckleberries. It was developed on land originally donated to the university. The existing single family residents to the west side of Boyer were constructed between 1910 and 1946. And on the north, those lots were developed in the 1990s and the 2010s. Uh, Moon Ridge is one of the most recent developments uh, in the city, and that's uh, just north of this. They also, by the way, have a pedestrian access uh, from their development to Boyer that's never been constructed, as far as I'm aware. Uh, the property was given its residential A zoning de designation when it was annexed in 1988. In 2007, the Wild Rose Foundation, um, is one of my first tasks as a planning director here, um, received a approval for a planned unit development for a whole university campus here. Over 100,000 square feet of uh, university space. And uh, um, unfortunately, due to the economic crisis at the time, the Great Recession, that never played out. But it did at the time allow a majority of buildings on the campus to be 45 feet or three stories to peak, with the campus clock tower and performing arts hall allowed a height of 50 feet to peak and additionally 45 feet or three stories for the proposed high school, which was gonna be on the southern end of the property. Then in 2010, um, per some correspondence with the city due to a variety of factors, including a funding constraint and the lack of demonstrated value to the local agricultural community, the existing facility has been mothballed by the university at the request of Dean Hamill, a strategic planning committee comprised of local business owners elected and university and government officials convened in the fall of 2010 to develop a viable transition plan for the facility. I was part of that transition planning team. In 2013, uh, with a defunct extension site, um, the university and the community was looking for a variety of other ways to use the property and uh, CUP 1301 was issued, allowing approximately 77 acres of the site to be used as a park for a variety of recreational and educational activity activities, including the driving range that the applicant was uh, one of the applicants was um, involved in. 2018, the city of Sandpoint uh, developed a master plan for the University of Idaho property. 2019, the city of Sandpoint failed to secure the property from the university to purchase it. 2019, the property was sold by the University of Idaho to the developers. Back in May, May 22nd, we submitted our application to the city of Sandpoint for preliminary plat. And here we are several months later, finally before you. So it's really exciting to finally be here. Next slide, please. Uh, this diagram on the left, just for, I guess, history, is what the uh, University of Idaho Extension uh, PUD was going to look like. You can see uh, hundreds and hundreds of parking spaces. Um, and anecdotally, not a whole lot of offsite improvements were gonna be required by that, but things have changed. In 2012, uh, image on the right, uh, the university, some of their architectural and planning classes devised a number of hypothetical scenarios that could potentially um, uh, fit the property if it were to develop. You can see uh, that one there. Next slide, please. But most importantly, 2018, the city of Sandpoint spent uh, a lot of effort, I know Aaron was involved in many of you, and time to develop a community visioning report um, in the report, uh, you'll see that uh, there's, there's a perspective and a context given to the fact that this, is, this area is going to develop. And in the lower right here, um, I just wanted to highlight um, the master plan described in this chapter references hundreds of hours of staff, consultant, and community time and effort, with the final plan striking a compromise between the community's desire for recreational open space and the city's need for enough development on the site to sustain continued recreation and use there. This plan will serve as a publicly adopted statement of intent, assuring potential partners in the property's development of the hoped for outcome of the site as it transitions from the University of Idaho into its ultimate use. Next slide, please. 
some excerpts from uh, the master plan. Um, there was a bit of a, a conflict, it seemed, when you read through it. Um, the plan talks about two and three story development, higher intensity development along the edge of Mountain View. But at the same time, they talk about um, some things that we try to incorporate because we, we certainly aren't moving forward with those two pink um, you know, highlights there. Uh, on the bottom left, they talk about uh, community garden and other local food facility and uh, some green space. And then on the right, the creek side, they really envision the sloped area to remain almost entirely natural, thick woods, steep slope, and immediate adjacency to Sand Creek argue for its preservation, which is what uh, the applicants have strived to do. Next slide, please. More excerpts from the plan. Um, Table 2.03, uh, in the plan, there's a discussion of what the density range per acre is on the envisioned development. I'll note that uh, in some areas, the density per acre is 120 dwelling units. On the right there, you'll see some green highlights and clearly the stakeholders uh, didn't uh, really agree, not all of them. And they suggest that any housing developed in the site should blend with the character of the existing neighborhood and include a mix of housing types. The residential development occurs and it should seek to fit into the existing community fabric, which is really what we've tried to do. Again, um, I don't mean to harp on this, but we've really taken this plan seriously and are trying to implement it to the best of our ability. Next slide, please. So this is a final vision in that um, expensive document that the city produced. Uh, it is a vision on the right. I'm not sure how well you can see it, but What's pretty remarkable is this vision generally uh, is not too different from what we're proposing tonight. So congratulations on the city for developing this vision and supporting um, it, you know, the process where the community could really speak out of what this site should become. Next slide, please. We have Katie Cox here tonight, the executive director of Connexie Land Trust, and it's really an honor and a privilege to announce tonight that um, part of this property, 27% um, of the land uh, west of the tracks, um, the, the developers have signed a letter of intent to place that land in a conservation easement and, and donate it to Conixie Land Trust, ensuring that that land, these three parcels that you see there, um, will be permanently protected and uh, available for public use. Um, Katie will speak more to that, but uh, the point here is that um, we are again trying to implement the vision of that plan um, as best we can. Jeremy, would Aaron, would you mind just identifying with your cursor what three parcels Jeremy's referring to? It's hard to see. Parcel one here, parcel two, these are the ponds in the middle, and parcel three is the northern uh, larger waterfront lot with uh, wetlands and slopes. So parcels one and two are interior within the development. Parcel three is kind of the northeast uh, That's frontage correct. along the creek, correct? correct? Yes. What about the frontage to the south on the other side of the tracks? Is that not to be conserved? To the east, you mean? To the, the, yeah, to the east of the tracks. The uh, not at the, this point, that's uh, commercially zoned. So um, there's really not a long-term vision yet for that. Um, this is a sort of a phased approach, so we'll see. Um, and I'll let, again, Katie speak to the um, the eventual um, intent, uh, obviously, Kinixu, and as this proceeds, it would have to uh, be commensurate and in agreement with city standards and codes and uses. Moving on, in that um, wonderful um, community visioning report for this property, uh, there are five, more than five, real goals um, economic development goals, housing goals, environmental conservation goals, community character goals, and walkability goals. I will spare you at this time um, the uh, going on at length of all these. I just would highlight that uh, the development as proposed hits every single one of these. Moving on to the plan. So the plan is for uh, four phases, totaling 152 lots. And as you can see here, uh, they're broken up one, two, three, four. First lot, first phase is, I'm sorry, is 47 lots, bringing traffic onto Mountain View Road, East Mountain View to be specific. Phase two, 75 lots, and that makes the first connector uh, onto Boyer. Phase three, additional 22 lots. Phase four, four lots, 
and the second connection to Boyer. And finally, three open space lots and the commercial B lot to the east of the tracks. Next slide, please. There's been a lot of planning and design involved in this proposal before you tonight. First of all, traffic. David Evans and Associates, uh, DEA David Evans and Associates, um, did their traffic counts uh, in October 2019, peak trips identified. And the, the real critical thing here, I, I hope you can factor into your decision tonight, is these are measured based on, not on the current proposal for 152 lots, but on a very ambitious plan that will include potential commercial and multifamily development on the southern portion of the site. This time, we're not applying for zone changes or anything other than straight uh, single family subdivisions. So all those numbers and all this offsite improvement is based on a very ambitious plan and the city in, uh, asked us to really tell us what our vision is for the site. So in good faith, we, we, uh, we told them what the vision was. It may have bitten us in the butt though, because uh, the traffic study was also based on that and all the offsite improvements. So just keep that in mind. Stormwater, we use Century West Engineering. The runoff volume and rate uh, will be lower than the pre-development state due to stormwater detention. And there'll be enhanced filtration through the swales. Uh, wetlands have been identified. All required Army Corps permitting will be secured. Utilities, Century West Engineering, has uh, performed an analysis of the water and sewer. The lift station have been, has been analyzed and it has um, deemed to be sized to handle even the most ambitious future plans on the site. Um, that was part of our application submission. So we have done that work. Finally, Parkland, we unsuccessfully attempted to negotiate with the city to exchange some of the developable property uh, for Parkland. So we have proceeded um, and had a great relationship with Nixu as an alternative. Next slide, please. You know, some of the outcomes of this property, um, there were some public comments about the impact and the cost and whatnot. Uh, keep in mind that the city uh, standpoint uh, has um, adopted development impact fees and development impact fees, the short of them is they are an exaction. Uh, if you don't have development impact fees at a time like this, we might be negotiating to dedicate a park, dedicate some roads, dedicate some police trucks or fire trucks or radios. So the impact fees take care of all that because the city basically says, we know how much it costs to serve every new house. Just pay us that and we'll take care of it. We'll build our parks, we'll buy our police trucks, and it's a much more proportional way to do things. Uh, with impact fees though, there's this issue of double dipping and um, uh, you're paying for traffic once, but are, do you really have to pay for it twice? And I'll bring that up in just a moment. But in total, the estimated development impact fees from the site would uh, exceed over 1.2 million. And again, 550,000 for parks, 112,000 for fire, 62,000 for police, 375,000 for streets, and 104,000 for new bicycle and pedestrian pathways. Next slide, please. In addition to impact fees at full build out, uh, this development just based on uh, the residential um, development could provide over $750,000 of annual property taxes in Bonner County. And uh, that's based on assumption of about 20% of the folks being second home owners who aren't getting the homeowner's exemption. exemption. So that's obviously quite significant over uh, 10 years. That's, you know, closer to $6 million. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a fair amount of money that this development will be pumping into the economy or to the uh, local tax coffers. Next slide, please. I wanna address some comments and concerns first about traffic. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of a cooperative agreement between the city of Sandpoint regarding US-2 and um, a project known as the curve and the reversion of city streets. Um, and I won't go into too much depth on this, but I'd like to just convey the intent of it. And the intent of this agreement basically is ITD said, you don't want the curve, you don't want the couplet, you don't want six lanes. There's gonna be a, a degradation in the level of service on your side streets. And you are agreeing that uh, priority shall always be given to the mainline US-2 traffic and delay will not be adjusted on US-2 to improve mobility on the side streets if the minimum peak hour performance level service D is not being met on US-2 as outlined in the separate cooperative agreement. What this basically means is Larch and US-2, um, Fifth Ave, Cedar, US-2, the city is acknowledging that there is an exchange and a trade-off and that 
many of these side streets are gonna see a degraded level of service. Um, further, I would point, next slide please, um, that we hired David Evans and Associates and we are advised to do that by the city. DEA is the firm who developed the city's urban area transportation plan that's currently in force and is arguably the most knowledgeable firm in the area in regards to that plan. We of course defer to the findings of the traffic engineers. I'm not a traffic expert. Ryan's not a traffic expert from Century West, but he certainly knows traffic as the former public works director for the city of Sandpoint. Um, but we defer to them and specifically a couple things. One, you heard tonight um, that US2 and Larch is failing currently. I, I heard that, I wrote it down, I'm sure you, you all heard that. So there's this question is, uh, and there's, there's a bit of case law here, I'm not an attorney, but um, if there's a failing piece of infrastructure, it's not equitable to make a developer come in and fix your failing piece of infrastructure. If it's a failing piece of infrastructure, the city has failed to maintain that, and it's their responsibility to fix those failures. Um, secondly, uh, specifically speaking to East Mountain View Road here, um, this is actually uh, the city's traffic consultant speaking to this. Uh, a third lane, um, without the project, a third lane along Mountain View Road does not appear to just be justified uh, by 2030. The classification conversion to a minor arterial also doesn't seem justified as this road does not provide inter-community travel and, and connect to a greater roadway network. A collector street classification seems more appropriate. And then below, uh, Mountain View Road would oper operate acceptably without widening to include a two-way left turn lane. Widening to three lanes does not appear to be justified by the addition of the project. That's this project that we're asking for. Bike pet improvements were not recommended based on the study. Mountain View Road currently has a multi-use path along the south side, adi, adi, adi. Again, the point here is um, the the fear and, and the concern about cut through traffic to the north um, it may be legitimate, but uh, the standards the city set up are based on empirical evidence, and we use empirical evidence in reports and studies and plans that the city has put in place. Um, the plan, as modeled by two engineering firms, says that a turn lane on East Mountain View is not necessitated. Um, it is simply a desire of the city based on uh, a concern about potential cut through and neighbors cut through traffic. Well, I live on a cul-de-sac, but other people in this community don't live on a cul-de-sac and every street in Sandpoint has cut through traffic. It's just a product of our traffic system. Further, there's a number of vacant lots to the north and east of this property that eventually will tie into um, these local roads and uh, collector roads. And the question is, why should we have to pay for that uh, widening, that extra turn lane when there are gonna be future people coming along that are gonna add traffic to it. So I just uh, suggest and ask as you proceed that there's some consideration given to that and um, maybe it's that turn lane is only triggered upon the build out of the vision for commercial and maybe some multifamily on the southern part of the site. I don't know, it just seems a bit of a, an exaction at this point that doesn't seem called for. Uh, with that, uh, your honorable commission members, I would certainly entertain any questions that you have for myself the applicant or our engineer. Jeremy, this is Tom Riggs. I do have a question. Let me find my question. Um, in, you, you mentioned some open, open space lots where um, Sand Creek Lane comes down from Mountain View into the, about the middle of the property and then you have South Sand Creek Lane coming north and there's a, what appears to be lot, lot one and lot 20 in between those, those two terminus. Yep. And the are those open space lots? They are not, um, Commissioner Riggs. Uh, the vision there, and we are still working on this as it proceeds, is is a access easement uh, right on those two lot lines that would allow uh, a continuance uh, for uh, trespass or public access to connect all three of them. Is there any is there any provision for accessing the? the Sand Creek area on, in the east part of the parcel, the, the slopes and down to the, to the creek bottom. Uh, 
the, the question, uh, Mr. Riggs, or Commissioner Riggs, um, is there uh, a plan for access? At this point in time, we would be working with, as well as the whole community, with uh, Kinixu Land Trust if this dedication does actually proceed, if this subdivision application is approved. So we would be working with uh, everyone to uh, uh, envision the final use of that land. Uh, our initial conversations have included the concept of a trail that runs um, all the way through that uh, to ensure that there's uh, connectivity to Popsicle Bridge and through the property. Is it safe to assume that any access to that green space, to that uh, conserved land from within the neighborhood would be private access, yet the trails within that property are public trails. So the public would have to access it via Mountain View Drive, Popsicle Bridge area. Yeah, um, uh, Commissioner Wilker, um, the discussion so far are that that would be treated similar to how, I guess, Pine Street Woods would be treated. It's, it would be Conixu's land. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be deeded to them. Um, the access to it um, would be from East Mountain View. Um, it would be from South Sand Creek Lane or through the other parcels um, if a trail were ever developed through them. Okay, but I, I take it there's no there's no current proposal as part of these subdivision plans for where these trails might go. No, uh, we didn't want to put the cart before the horse, so to speak, uh, Commissioner Riggs. So um, um, at this point, we are set up and prepared to execute this. We have a letter of intent signed with Conixie Land Trust, and if you followed some of their properties and maybe they have a representative here tonight who could speak to it uh, in the public section, but um, you know, there, it's a process to determine where trails might go and the uses and things like that. We're very hopeful and uh, it's been a very productive and encouraging conversation so far. Thank you. I, I have a question uh, on the, the the lots that uh, on the east side of this off South Sand Creek, you spoke earlier about some of the uh, storm water abatement issues. Did those lots, which um, the ownership, but certainly the impact would be direct to Sand Creek. Is there any sort of special um, abatement that would be done on those private lots to prevent runoff into Sand Creek? Uh, you know, um, Commissioner Hastings, uh, great question. Uh, you know. Looking at the variety of designs, uh, I think you all might recognize that those lots actually could have been extended right to Sand Creek and every one of those parcels could have had a waterfront lot. Um, we, uh, the, uh, the developers chose not to do that and, and the thinking right now is that that uh, very plentiful uh, buffer, that, that very plentiful buffer would be sufficient at this point to um, you know, uh, address any kind of runoff. Um, typically, it's you know your your lawn fertilizers and stuff like that. But it's it's a pretty significant distance from those. It, those it is, and that's nice. It's also incredibly steep in there, though, too. So that's my concern. But yeah. Are there more questions uh, for Mr. Grimm? I have a question. So Kate? Go ahead, Kate. Um, uh, Mr. Grimm, in the uh, the application, that uh, there are several referrals to private open space and private trampled space with the word private underlined. What what is that about? Sure, Commissioner Huseman. Um, at the time of the submission, we were uh, trying our best with not a lot of success to engage the city uh, in terms of their master parks plan and the potential interest to uh, exchange property uh, in the proposed subdivision uh, in exchange for credits or other things that would allow the city to develop a park in this area since it's generally underserved we thought but um, city's testimony in other meetings has suggested this area is better served with park development uh, in other areas of the city so 
those are underlined and highlighted. Uh, just for clarification, at the time we hadn't had discussions with Connexi Land Trust and we weren't uh, proposing just to give them to no one or to maintain them. So um, at that time it was going to be considered private, uh, potentially for future development or uh, other use. But since the staff report has been submitted and the application has been submitted, we're, we're very excited to have um, successfully worked with a Connexu Land Trust on the, uh, on the letter of intent for dedication of this area. So let me just confirm that those, those uh, three plots, lots, portions, one, two, and three that you showed us on that platting map will be open to the public. Uh, uh, Commissioner Huseman, at this point in time, we have a letter of intent uh, because the final plat is what is required to actually dedicate land. Um, we obviously can't dedicate a lot to them. So we have meets and bounds descriptions of these areas and deeds that would uh, effectively dedicate them. And that's what we're prepared to do upon uh, City Council's uh, preliminary plat approval of the subdivision application. Okay. It's complex. Let me confirm at least that the intent is to make those lands available to the public. That would be up to Connexu Land Trust um, and maybe um, their executive director can speak uh, later in the meeting about that. Okay, thanks. Mr. Graham, I have a question. So it seems from your presentation that the two proposed conditions that you object to are the developer contributing um, the proposed fair share of 2.45% to a uh, turn lane on Highway 2 and Larch and the widening of East Mountain View Road. Is that correct? You seem to have concluded your presentation opposing that proposal to widen East Mountain View Road to allow for a third lane for traffic to turn left onto Boyer. Um, Commissioner Wilker, um, I'll have a chance to rebut any other public comments. Um, I do have some other thoughts uh, regarding the conditions that I'd like to at least put forth. Uh, at the same time, uh, I, I would hate, I don't know how uh, much energy you have in terms of getting into the details of the development agreement, uh, because a lot of that, there'll be negotiation based on any conditions you place between here and the city council's hearing. Um, but we do have some other thoughts um, about some of those conditions. For example, on that East Mountain View, might it be more appropriate only to put in that extra turn lane um, uh, upon the initiation of, uh, or the rezoning of the Southern portion of the property to commercial and uh, multifamily, um, because that's what those traffic volumes were based on. And I'm not sure, and the developers aren't sure that's gonna ever happen based on market conditions. Um, in addition, um, Double check. Oh, the you brought up the block length that was brought up at the beginning of the meeting. Um, block one, you know, whether it's semantics or not, um, you know, when we looked at this, there is cattail lane that uh, comes in from the east of block one. Um, certainly on the east side, that block is broken up. Uh, fully agree and acknowledge on the west side, fronting Boyer, the block is not broken up. Um, you know, whether or not it's a, um, an access easement uh, or a pathway could be installed or not. Uh, I, I just look at other types of exactions like this that have uh, been put in place for Moon Ridge and up at Cedars of Sand Creek. And it seems to me that um, few of them ever seem to be implemented. So um, if it's gonna be implemented, that's great. And we'd certainly implement it if it's a condition. It's just uh, seems like something that usually just comes up as a extra at a meeting and it sounds good, but um, so that would be one I certainly, and if you're gonna go down that road, um, the block on South Sand Creek Lane, uh, the Northeast Corridor, block three, I believe, um, you know, that's kind of an odd uh, piece of land there. Um, is it a block? I don't know, um, but uh, any access through there, again, I think you have the power to provide a variance to those standards. But that would conclude any thoughts we have at this time on uh, the draft agreement.
Aaron? Yes, Chairman. Okay, I'm, I was out of commission there techn technologically, but I think I'm back in operation. Are you um, able to hear everything, Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh huh. So, Jeremy, my, my understanding is your presentation is completed. Is that right? That's correct, unless there's any additional questions, Mr. Chairman. Are there other questions for Jeremy Grimm? I have a question. Yeah. Um, this may be to staff, actually. Um, has there been any consideration for um, times of the year when groundwater is elevated and with the, with the current uh, runoff uh, infiltrating the sewer system? Would this impact that in a negative way to where we would be more of a bottleneck? Um, and is that going to be a concern as far as some of these impact fees? I know, I know we have a plan that they're supposed to go to a certain, <clears throat> certain stuff, but to me, it seems like that's one of the bigger concerns is with uh, this many new residences in a short period with, uh, you know, a springtime thaw or wintertime thaw and the groundwater table increasing, is that going to make that a bigger problem than what we have right now and speed up the, the need to take care of that? You're speaking specifically of uh, inflow and infiltration into the sewer system? Just yeah, and <clears throat> so with this project in a short time period, put enough stress on that. Has there been some kind of study to, sure. to see if that's going to address that now? Yes, thank you, Dan. Uh, I, I don't have any concerns with I and I from this development. We're going to have brand new PVC mains and, and service laterals. So we all new construction. We'll have new uh, san sanitary sewer manholes, typically where we see the I and I and the inflow of the groundwater and surface run runoff into our sanitary sewer system is typically with our older sewer mains, older sewer manholes, uh, older developments where the laterals may have been compromised by tree roots or other things, older pipe materials um, with new construction, there should be little to no I and I impacts on this uh, from this development. Yeah, I, I understand that, but what I'm getting at is we already have a problem. And so with the increased flow with, with, the, with the good system, how much difference is that going to be in in a in a period where there is a high runoff? You're talking about plant capacity at the treatment plant. Yeah. So well, yeah. So where there's, uh, <clears throat> like I said, a bottleneck, and then the and then the uh, the plant has to discharge untreated. Uh, yeah. From runoff. from this development, uh, this development all. Um, well, phase one of this development will all drain by gravity sewer flow to an existing lift station. That ex existing lift station will cycle more frequently. However, the flows in the system for the most part will remain the same. It's going to, you know, drain the wet well at a certain frequency. The frequency is going to increase ultimately at the plant. So the system down to the plant should be fine. Uh, the, at the plant itself, that's a whole separate effort and a separate project. We're in the early stages of uh, that, a, a far robust wastewater treatment plant upgrade. Um, this, this project is not going to cause uh, a concern with uh, uh, overcapacity at the plant. If, that, if I'm understanding your, your question correctly, that plant, um, we have been whittling away at the INI through our cured in place pipe projects. We have a um, sewer lateral improvement project in a, in a basin in South Sandpoint planned. It's just out for bid now. This will uh, help to further reduce INI. That's a continual effort and early indications are we've, we've been successful. Our peak flows at the plant have decreased. We had some significant rain on snow events this past winter and we've seen a reduction in what we saw previously. That's not to say that we're out of the woods, but um, our future plan upgrades will consider expansion of the system, growth, and uh, I and I impacts all of that. So this project shouldn't 
or you, you, your consideration of this project, you shouldn't be concerned with the plant capacity because we will address that in other ways. Okay. Yeah, I don't have any concerns with this project. Well, I have concerns that the current city infrastructure is already not at the current state able to handle current events that can overflow it. And so I guess what I'm saying is, is this just gonna, are we, are we gonna add to the problem? We have to address Maybe, the you plan know, anyways. The, yeah. We have to address the plan issues regardless of this development or not. So is there a potential that phase one goes in and would, uh, I can't remember, 57 homes go in right away in a couple of years? Is the infrastructure gonna be catching up to that? To that, where that that's the hope. I mean, every year is different, every event's different, rain on snow, and, and it's difficult to predict. Some years we don't get those big peaks at the plant, other years we do. This development is not going to cause uh, a violation at the plant. Uh, uh, okay. I'm good. And also, Jeremy, you said uh, 750000 in property tax. Is that just to the city or is that total? Um, that would be total uh, to the city. It would be approximately uh, 300000 a year. And that's at like current conditions if it was built out okay. with, uh, with, uh, as, as estimated in that traffic study. Okay. Okay, um, other questions for Mr. Graham, or if not, uh, Jeremy, is there someone else who wishes to speak on behalf of the applicant? Um, I, you know, Mr. Chairman, I defer to Katie Cox from Kinixu, Executive Director of Kinixu Land Trust. Um, solely for the purpose of getting her out of here uh, on this night as soon as possible, but uh, she was planning on speaking at the public forum, but you do have some questions regarding how that might work. So I defer to Katie. Okay, that, that'd be fine. That's fine? Okay. Yes, go, go okay. ahead, Katie Cox. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? Great. Good evening. I'm Katie Cox. I'm executive director of the Connexu Land Trust. I'm happy to be here tonight with you all. On behalf of the board and staff of Connexu Land Trust, I would like to express my support for the preliminary plat and subdivision request for University Park. This is truly an exciting opportunity for our community and KLT looks forward to working closely with the developers regarding future determinations for conservation and public access and use. The owners of the property have clearly expressed their plans to grant a portion of this land to Connexu Land Trust for conservation benefit and public use through the exercise of a letter of intent. This dedication will serve the community by providing public access to open space that is of his historical significance to our community while simultaneously ensuring protection of the ecologically important riparian areas adjacent to Sand Creek. The 75-acre University Park property has long been on KLT's radar, as well as serving the community's needs related to agricultural research, learning, and recreation. The site has served as the location of KLT's first BioBlitz in 2016, and for the first two seasons of our very successful Camp Kinixu in 2017 and 2018. As you are likely aware, the former University of Idaho parcel on Boyer harbors both historically and ecologically significant features that make it unique within our community. This project aligns with the efforts and focus of the work we undertake at Connexu Land Trust. First being habitat. The riparian corridor along Sand Creek provides important urban habitat for a variety of wildlife. Large mammals use the creek as a migration route and the area abounds with birds. Seasonal variation in water levels make this a dynamic, active place. KLT's uh, BioBlitz in 2016 identified a number of rare plants here that are found at only a few locations across our entire state. Second being water quality. The parcel includes nearly half a mile of frontage on Sand Creek, all of which is currently proposed as open space. Maintaining this vegetative buffer will prevent sedimentation and contamination of the stream during the development stage of the adjacent upland areas and throughout the life of this development. 
Um, in regards to a question by Commissioner Hoosman, I just want to um, refer to public access. Knixu Land Trust, as you all know, we, we strive for public access. You can see it at Pine Street Woods where we have opened 180 acres um, for the benefit of our community. The proposed open space areas include the diverse riparian corridor along Sand Creek, as well as an experimental mixed hardwood plantation that was established in the 1980s. Continued access to these areas will provide opportunities for education in addition to close to home recreation for city residents. This is especially critical here as this neighborhood has been recognized by the city of Sandpoint as an area in need of more park and open space. A strong focus of our work in the past few years has been a focus on connectivity. We strive to help our community spend more time outside. We know that supporting us health, the health and vitality of all of our community is important. This also helps um, our children become stewards of the beauty that surrounds us. To make this happen, we at Connexu Land Trust are focusing on connectivity. Our goal is to support an interconnected trail system in our community. As I like to say, uh, we are working to get everyone from their front door to a trail within a mile from their home. This project is a huge step in achieving this goal. Along with the trail system, we are considering on this site, a regional public access trail network has been developed adjacent um, to and near the property. The property's central location presents an opportunity to further extend and enhance this network, which includes the Popsicle Bridge, Sand Creek Bike Path, Dover Bike Path, City Beach, and Downtown Sandpoint. Working to ensure co continued access to the University Park parcel has long been a strategic objective of Canixu Land Trust, and we are thrilled by the opportunity to partner with the current owners to achieve this goal. Based on the layout that has been shared with us and the work currently underway in partnership with our organization, we fully support this development proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Any Are questions? there questions? Um, do commissioners have questions for Katie Cox? I do. Hi, Katie. Um, I'm still just a little confused about what the, I know that obviously the large area north uh, and on the far east of the property, west of the railroad tracks. Um, for now, nothing east of the railroad tracks. But then it, there appear to be two little, two very small little parcels west of that main forested um, Sand Creek frontage. Is there any possibility for connectivity from East Mountain View Lane, pu public connectivity, um, through the, the um, forested area and then out to Boyer. Exactly. Now, are those are those KLT owned parcels connected or because on when Aaron showed them to us, it kind of looked like there are three separate chunks that weren't connected themselves. They are three um, separate chunks, but the connectivity is through roadways. And so it would be a trail access. I mean, as we are seeing it, it would be a trail access that would bring uh, allow for people to enter from Boyer and then go through the development all the way up to sort of what we know as Popsicle Bridge through this that Sand Creek Riparian Corridor. That's what we're discussing right now in this okay. phase one. I have a question. Yeah. This is a conservation easement. This is right. We are still in discussions about what how we will do this project. It will either be a conservation easement or a gift of land. And to be clear, this isn't part of the proposal. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Ms. Cox? Hearing none. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Um, Aaron, I believe that we are at the point of moving on to opening the hearing. Is that correct? I think so, if you concur. All right. We will now proceed with the public hearing. As a reminder, if commissioners have the qu questions for persons testifying, they should ask those questions at the time the person is at the podium. <clears throat> the public hearing is um, is now open. Residents of the city of Sandpoint will speak first, followed, followed by those who live outside our city limits. Each speaker will have up to three minutes to speak.
First, we will hear from those people in favor of the application. Um, City Clerk, who will be our first speaker? Deborah Zybel, do you wish to speak in favor or neutral? Um, thank you. Um, I believe that the developers have done a very nice job. As someone who's lived on Sand Creek Lane for almost 12 years. Uh, excuse, I, excuse me, could so, you identify yourself, please? Can I what? Could you identify State yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Deborah Zebel, and I live on Sand Creek Lane. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I believe the developers have done a very nice job. I've been lived in that area, um, but I have one concern, which is traffic. And I think um, probably at this point, it's unfair to um, ask them to put in a roundabout or a traffic light on East Mountain View to Boyer. However, by the time phase three is open, I believe it's going to be a real nightmare trying to get on to Boyer from East Mountain View. So um, if something could be taken into consideration, I don't know if a roundabout is, if there's enough right of way um, or a traffic light, but I do believe it was brought up that a lot of traffic will start routing through Aspen. And I, I totally concur with that. And I also feel like um, once phase two, once phase two is able to access East Mountain View through phase three, that's the point at which the traffic is going to be a nightmare, basically. So that's all I have to say. I, I have a question for you. Uh -huh. um, can you give us an idea of what the current like peak traffic is like on East Mountain View turning left onto North Boyer, uh, you know, during the quote morning rush is, is if we have one in San Juan. Um, are, are there currently backups ever on East Mountain View? I can, I can tell you I've kind of watched over the last few days and it took probably, I had to wait for six cars going both ways and this was non-peak. Um, anywhere from three to six cars in non-peak times. And when the trains go by, or, and sometimes that traffic is backed up past East Mountain View. So that's where I feel like a lot of times the traffic is probably going to be routed through the, new, the current Aspen Way development because they're going to try and get back behind all that traffic or sidestep it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa, you want to call on the next uh, speaker? Marlo Jenkins. Hi, I'm Marlo Jenkins and I live in South Sandpoint. And I would just like to thank Katie Cox and the Knick Sioux Land Trust and the owners of the land. If you could give them a big thank you for actually being concerned about leaving open space. Um, that's so exciting to me. That's I came here to fight for that open space mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. well, it's already there thanks to you guys and the owners. So thank you so much for that. And that's so important to have that open space because when all this building is happening and the talk about the taxes and the revenue and everybody gets excited about the money, they forget about what made this place so beautiful and they build all over the land and then it's not what it used to be. And then people will move on and look for that next new place that has open land. So I'm just so excited about that. Um, 5,100 square feet lots is pretty small. I'm disappointed that that's what Sandpoint's general plan, you know, says is the minimum. And I'm disappointed that the developer, 
I don't know how many plots are 5,100 square feet, but it seems to me like that's money talking. Fit as many houses as you can get in there um, with the minimum amount that the city will allow, which is going to, of course, increase the traffic and the people. So I'm a little bit disappointed in that because I don't know what study this was that he was referring to that people prefer 5,100 or five to 6,000 uh, square foot lots. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I certainly wouldn't. Um, so my hope was that the development would have a little bit bigger plots of land um, for families. And I was listening to the developer talk and it sounded almost like when the one commissioner was asking about why it says private on those plots, and the developer, it sounded like what he was saying was, well, we're going to keep them private unless you give us something. And it almost sounded like a little bit of a, a blackmail or a holding you guys hostage. Like, well, if you want to really see those public, then you better make sure when later on down the road, when I want to rezone something, you better approve the rezone or um, you better pay for them. You know, no HOA, but I want the city to take responsibility of paying for the maintenance. So that was a little bit disappointing too. Um, if they start development one, I can't remember from the picture there if development one went against, um, what's the rule called? The road mount, mountain, whatever that road mountain is. View. If they start phase one, can't remember if it hit right up against there because later on you won't be able to widen the road. Mr. Chairman, that so, is three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Chris Bassett. Uh, my name is Chris Bassett. I'm the executive director at the Bonner Community Housing Agency. I did send a letter in uh, earlier. Hopefully you all received that. I wanted to highlight a couple of uh, items, uh, just information about the housing situation and why um, Bonner Community Housing Agency supports the University of Idaho uh, property development uh, where it sits. <coughs> So based on the most recent U.S. Census Bureau data for the city of Sandpoint, median income is $41,385. According to HUD, Housing and Urban Development, over half of the city's population qualifies for federal and state-sponsored affordable housing assistance. It's over half of the city population. With the increase of retirees with investment income coming into the community in large numbers, the actual income totals are decreasing regionally because they bring passive investment income uh, into the community. Uh, it doesn't count as actual wages um, as far as income earnings. Um, one of the things that um, I wanted to look at is, is the reality that we have to increase the supply of affordable housing to create downward pressure. Um, against the continued um, skyrocketing of the prices that we have to deal with in, in the city of Sandpoint. Um, this need has, of course, been on the horizon for a long time. We know that the city has done things like add a, uh, accessory dwelling units, um, look at some other things as far as looking at smaller light sizes, uh, lot sizes for the sake of affordability. Um, and so when we look at the numbers of where we're at in affordability right now, Based on a year-to-year -year comparison between August of 2019 to August of 2020, the average sales price increased 12% from $403,652 to $450,000. The median sales price jumped 14%. The median uh, jumped from $330,000 to $375,000. Currently, According to what um, Housing and Urban Development considers to be affordable for the income um, of our region, uh, they consider a house that's less than 256000 to be the maximum amount of sales price that they would fund 
for any type of, whether they're giving a grant or they're giving a subsidized loan or anything like that um, to a buyer, their maximum is 256,000. So based on that, the median price is $119,000 in Sandpoint, higher than the, than the maximum affordability price um, for the income of our county, and our, I mean our city. Um, the uh, average sales price is nearly $200,000 higher um, in the monthly payments. This is, you know, um, way, way out of reach for people who live and work here. Um, Mr. Chairman, that is three minutes. Okay. Okay. And we support the development. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. thank, thank you very much. Next, next speaker. <laughs> At this time, I would like to ask anyone who's participating by Zoom, if you are interested in testifying in favor of this application, please raise your hand. That appears to be all who wish to testify in favor, Mr. Chairman. Next, right, we have uh, so there's, sign ups there, for neutral. Excuse me, there's, there's no one else in the, uh, in, the, in the people present that wish to testify. No, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So moving on to those who are neutral. Rob Osborne. My name is Rob Osborne. I reside at 420 East Mountain View Drive. Um, our property is bisected by the bike trail that goes down to Popsicle Bridge. So we have about 600 feet of common property line to the development. Um, I signed up when I got here as neutral, but I, I mean, <laughs> once they announced the next to trust agreement, I would have come up and changed uh, that to in support of this proposed project. And if you know the property very well there, you can see uh, for obvious reasons why I'm pretty excited about that. A little concerned about how they'll access from Kaniksu property to the bike trail. Our property actually, property line is actually to the south of the easement that goes down to the creek. So there's there's some issues there, but we're certainly anxious and willing to work with Kaniksu land trust on that. Um, some of the notes I had that I developed earlier, and I did submit a letter earlier to the city. Um, I know we've discussed the traffic at Mountain View and Boyer. My experience there has been that um, accessing Mountain View off of Boyer when you're southbound has uh, created some really ugly incidents traffic wise. Uh, people get backed up and um, especially if there's a, a group of train traffic vehicles uh, coming through there. Um, a left turn lane there would alleviate that. I know that's not a part of this development, but it seems like it would be something for uh, the city to consider. Um, that train crossing is the primary access train to the soon to be doubled train bridge across the river. That, that, that crossing in particular will be impacted significantly with increased train traffic. So that is going to increase. Also, one of the assumptions in the traffic report that I saw were that the uh, they were basing a, a higher percentage on traffic heading south out of the development toward the city of Sandpoint as opposed to traffic heading north. Um, that's not been my experience. Um, the big box stores from these bedroom communities are a huge attraction. Um, the more tourist related activities in, in town don't typically attract that kind of traffic. Um, I'm about out of time, so that I'm not even getting close to what I wanted to talk about. But um, so yeah, my votes for it. I, I appreciate what the developer is doing. Um, five, four, three, two, one. That's it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. Mr. Chairman? Yes. 
This time I would like to ask anyone um, participating by Zoom, if you would like to testify and you are neutral to the application, please uh, raise your hand. We do have someone here. Molly O'Reilly. Hi there, thank you so much. Uh, I live on St. Clair Avenue and I am a Sandpoint resident. And I would like to talk about and Boyer with this great long block. I hope the city will not be requiring and the developer will not put up an endless fence there. Think about your eight-year-old on that trail caught between cars on one side and no access to real people who might bail them out of a problem if their bike crashes or somebody approaches them inappropriately. So there should be some ability for individual property owners or trail users to have some access to real people there because our kids need to be able to use that kind of thing. I would also say that if the city's going to make any changes at Larch and Fifth, that putting a pedestrian crossing on the north side across the highway would be really good because right now you're asking people to cross three ways if they just want to cross once. If they're on, you know, using buttons as bicyclists or pedestrians. And I want to thank Ms. Huseman, Commissioner Huseman, for raising bicycle and pedestrian issues. If we build for everybody to get around in every way, not just by motor vehicles, we'll have way less congestion in our auto lanes. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. O'Reilly. Mr. Chairman, there are no other hands raised for uh, those on, or taking a neutral position. Um, we do have a couple signed up here who are opposed to the application. The first is uh, John uh, Chambu. Thank you very much. Uh, resident of Sandpoint, uh, I was fortunate to live in other uh, mountain towns and cities like that. I think, uh, with these developments and the building that's going on, we're not meeting the trail system that we should uh, for bikers and everything like that. And I oppose uh, the development because he's saying secondhand, uh, second homeowners. So he's not referring to, if you have 152 units, you figure that's 225 cars, one and a half cars per unit. And you're thinking about that in Boyer. I bike Boyer and go up to uh, uh, up the mountain or go Boyer. My wife and I will go to, uh, uh, to the restaurant down in, uh, God, I can't think of the name. I'm a little nervous. But uh, the traffic there uh, during biking, and as far as uh, the drivers, uh, we live on Boyer and Cedar. And uh, we live in the apartment, in the condo unit over there. And we're seeing logging trucks and everything go down Boyer where, you know, it should just be sort of residential and have the traffic go down 200. You know, uh, that's already a backup on uh, Boyer and Cedar early in the morning uh, between uh, 6 o'clock in the morning to about 8.30. So you have all these logging trucks, uh, construction trucks, and everything that go down Boyer. And if you go towards the circle at large, you can see the roads over there, how damaged they are already. Uh, you're, you're talking about the, the circle right there, the damages from the heavy trucks that go up and down Boyer. You can see that that's all going to have to be built. Uh, you know, 15 acres for 75 acres, uh, not really a plan where the trails are going or anything like that. Um, you know, in, the gentleman that left, he did, you know, we have workers here that can't afford a place to live. I mean, people that work, live in Walmart, work at Walmart stores downtown, they can't even afford rent. 
We're talking about second to uh, homeowners already. That's how the proposal is. What what is one of those houses going to cost? I mean, we have enough uh, second uh, homeowners in Dover. We have uh, communities that can't we we can't even get to on bikes anymore because it's uh, private communities. And in this uh, development, they're saying it's a private. It's centered right in the middle of the the development. And uh, you know, for the bikers and everything like that, you're getting a very good biking community here. We should address all that. We should address uh, you know the people that are coming in here that live here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Linda uh, Shambu. Thank you. Um, I was pleased by some of the conversations tonight to hear some of the plans with Kaniska and the land trust. I was a little disappointed though, and that's why I would oppose it even at this point, because I didn't think, I didn't hear a strong enough commitment and a strong enough yes, no from the developers. It was kind of like, well, we think, well, we kind of are gonna work toward, well, what does that really mean at the end of the day? You know, this is this land is going to be developed. There's no more options after that. <laughs> that um, how many miles along Sand Creek is going to be gone? Um, there was I noticed on the beginning of the path or the beginning there was a map that outlined the walking areas with a little dotted line, and along the creek there was a little dotted line. I don't think that was a property line. I believe that was a walking path. But that wasn't even addressed regarding with the with the public um, with the public lands trust. Is that going to be a walking area for the public? And again, there was just a lot of hesitation and a lot of delays. And I don't, I really didn't see a true commitment. And so for that reason, until I would hear that ring true, I would probably want to delay. I don't know the the approval of it. The other reason why, um, because again, is it going to be public lands? Am I going to have access um, via foot or car to those areas? Um, the next thing would be the, you did a lot of work with the impact, but John brought up the point of the, the other human impact. What about that? What about people that I was surprised for the hub, the person for the hub being for this with only 50 homes allotted as um, affordable housing out of 152 lots. 50, or, so I guess maybe there's a total of 200. Again, I wasn't quite clear on that and I wasn't in a position to ask these questions. But I was surprised that 50 homes, and what is a, what affordable housing does that mean? There are many people who can't even afford the affordable housing in town, as you know. And I was astonishing the cost that, that has escalated due to largely second homeowners. People working on this project, they probably won't be able to afford to live in San Point, let alone their children. And I think that, you know, and when he, there was a little pressure put on, well, what about that south block, the, I think it was the fourth stage or third stage of the development that provides for those affordable homes? Well, there was something modeled at the end of that, and it was kind of like, well, if we do, and there was a yeah, there's some qualifiers. So I really again didn't like. So for those reasons, that's why I was told. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I would like to any uh, anyone else attending by Zoom, if you would like to speak in opposition to this application, please raise your hand at this time. Uh, no, no one participating remotely uh, wishes to speak, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Um, I believe then that brings us to rebuttal testimony, if, if any, from the applicant. <clears throat> Jeremy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jeremy Grimm with UROC Planning. I'm not the owner or developer of the land, just the developer's representative for clarity. Um, I want to just address a couple of things that were brought up. Um, 
the first has to do with um, some of the opposition and the, the question about walkability. And, um, you know, this is a preliminary plat. Um, you know, we don't even know what you're going to do or the council's going to do. So obviously no one's going to, on our side, commit to things till we see how things play out here. I can tell you it is the, the developers and the owners full intent to uh, execute that letter of intent with Conixu Land Trust to dedicate this land to them. And similarly, they can't really speak to or put energy and effort into what the use and the trail system, potential trail system will look like until they have that dedication and, and then they can start planning. So uh, I, I, I respect the concern that was raised, but um, these things come in uh, measured steps. It's uh, one, one step and then the next. So uh, the way of it set up right now is um, a commitment to move forward as, as uh, presented. Um, and in terms of the, the affordability, uh, we all know it's a critical issue for this community right now. Um, the, as, as may have come through in the application, uh, phase four, um, we ran the traffic analysis based on a future potential rezoning that would allow some of that to become multifamily and some of it to become uh, CA4 type commercial in accordance with the comp plan. Um, we gave some numbers for the traffic analysis and uh, if, if the owners proceed with that, uh, that area would include some multifamily housing. Um, so I just wanted to address that, that this is, this is a um, uh, stepping stone to get us there. Uh, the first task right now is to um, uh, just address um, the application before you. Um, I think that's all the rebuttal that uh, I have right now. Uh, thank you very much. Unless there's any other questions from the commission of old, old information. Any more, any more questions from the commission for um, Mr. Grimm? Not hearing any. No. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Um, I believe, Aaron, let's say, help me out here. I believe we're to the point of now closing the public hearing. Is that right? Correct. Okay, then I will close the public hearing at this point. At this time, the commission will deliberate. Commissioners, if you wish to make a motion, suggested motions for approving and denying are provided in the staff report, as are uh, suggestions, suggested conditions to approval. So with that, I will open it up to the commission. I have a, uh, just a question, I guess. For the, uh, city staff um, when we're talking about this kind of being the a uh, preliminary but it sounds a little bit more developed than that as far as this this plan how much negotiation would still be going into the process from this point forward uh, concerning some of the things we've heard such as right turn lanes for convenience or left turn lanes for safety um more public access how much of that is still negotiable in the process as it goes forward from here well uh council has a final decision making authority so it's it's difficult to say uh, at this point uh, your task tonight is to forward on a recommendation uh phil do, would you do you have anything to add uh to that question um well i think um we shouldn't assume there's much uh, flexibility beyond this point in terms of what the um, Planning and Zoning Commission would like to see. Um, I think uh, if there is uh, a concern about any of the issues that were raised, <clears throat> I think now is the time to address them. Um, certainly the uh, City Council is at their discretion to uh, uh, deploy their, uh, their opinion as well. So. Um, well, I think uh, there is some, certainly some uh, negotiation with regard to the development agreement, and certainly engineering uh, decisions need to get made on the specifics of uh, the uh, 
Boyer and, and Mountain View Roads, I think uh, generally uh, if uh, you're comfortable with what the uh, recommended uh, conditions are, I think this is the point to, to say so. And uh, uh, again, I think the case can be made to the uh, City Council if uh, further conversation needs to be made. In, in earlier discussions with the staff to get to this point, uh, at Mountain View and Boyer was um, a roundabout, anything that ever was considered? Not at that intersection. And, and Dan, please chime in here. It's my understanding that the, both the traffic impact analysis and the, um, uh, and the subsequent analysis by Fair and Piers did not uh, really warrant uh, improvements at that intersection of, of that that magnitude. That's correct. Uh, and, and Preston, please speak up if I'm uh, misspeaking here. I, I believe the the uh, existing conditions at uh, Mountain View and Boyer were uh, classified as a level of service a B, and with the full build out, the level of service was a C. So it dropped somewhat, but still a very serviceable uh, intersection within the. Uh, requirements of the city, you know, meeting the requirements, the minimum requirements, certainly at a level of service of D, it exceeded the minimum requirements. Is that level C uh, taking into account the proposed conditions? Level of C was full build out. Is that correct, Preston? That's accurate. Yep. So, so to exceed the minimum level D, we, sh we, these conditions should be met basically the widening the left turn lane. I would, um, I, the, is, is your estimate that without the conditions as described here um, of widening Mountain View Lane to 60 feet right away, 42 feet curb to curb, we would see us slip down to D? Is, is that? No, no, no the, the analysis states that two lanes mm -hmm. would be sufficient on East Mountain View strictly from a level of service perspective. So they're saying two lanes would meet a level of service of C. The third lane, uh, the turn lane, uh, staff condition, uh, proposed condition, is, is based on that feedback and that concern of if we don't provide that outlet uh, to allow that movement northbound on Boyer. So in, in, in the recommendation, um, let's see if I can find that now. <clears throat> I believe I, condition I, um, it talks about the the design shall provide a roadway section that provides for a total of approximately 42 feet between inside face of curves between North Boyer Avenue and Aspen Way to include a dedicated left turn lane. So that left turn lane would allow for the southern direction movement. The uh, right lane, I guess, in that situation would allow for that free right turn movement. So uh, the thought is that that will provide a relief for the Aspen Way in that neighborhood. Um, just based on human uh, willingness to tolerate a, a reduced level of service. Right. So without a third lane, we could expect it to slip to C. With a third lane, you maintain roughly the, um, something closer to the B level service that we currently have. Um, and I, I, I mean, a model would probably have to be run to determine what the level of service would be with a uh, turn lane that has not been run. Preston, am I speaking out of turn there or is that uh, an accurate statement? That is accurate, yep. It seems to me, John, do you have any other comments? No. It seems to me like reading all the letters from neighbors, the number one concern is traffic. Number two is public access. And I think that's what we've heard from the public tonight and um, what I think uh, Mr. Grimm's presentation focused on quite well. Um, it, coming into tonight, the public access was a big concern of mine. I'm a trail user myself. Um, I've worked with Connection Land Trust. I have, I have great confidence in their ability to provide public access. So now in this deliberation, I'm kind of turning my attention back to the, to the traffic question and hearing Mr. Grimm's um, opposition to this pro uh, proposed condition that Mountain View Lane be, Mountain View Drive be widened as described. Um, you know, I, 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 as an, if I were a neighbor in this, to this development, I, I too would be concerned about the traffic spilling over onto Aspen Lane and other possible routes to avoid 
long delays at Boyer. So um, I'm leaning towards keeping that condition in place. And I think that it's a rel for a relatively small ask of or exaction on the developer. We could maintain a level of service that will hopefully um, allay some of the concerns of the neighbors here. So I, I could see that being a major problem if, if there wasn't an option to turn left. And I also agree, um, who was it that spoke to the northbound traffic? That does seem like an important concern as well. That most of the shopping is, is in Ponderé. So I think we'll see, we could expect just as many people trying to turn right there, but having a, a dedicated left turn lane would allow for that. Um, so, and also the, I, had a, I just also a question, maybe this is obvious, but the phases, can we expect the development to be constructed in the phases numerically? So one is, is will be constructed 2021, 20, 2022, or are these phases just for describing the geographical locations within the development? They're intended for phases of development. Phil, do you want to speak to that specifically? Um, again, briefly, it's my understanding in terms of the uh, phasing schedule that we've uh, requested from the developer is they would uh, build them sequentially as they've numbered them. So the, um, the one, two, three, and four. So you would expect to see the uh, initial phase uh, up in the north uh, east section uh, fronting on uh, um, Mountain View. And then the second phase would be the large, I think it was painted pink in the, uh, in the, in the diagram uh, that would, uh, the larger one, which would then front out onto Boyer and then the uh, uh, corner up in the northwest and then the, uh, the larger area down at the south would be the fourth phase. And according to their schedule, that would be done by 2025, but that depends on market conditions, obviously. I would like to also just ask a question of maybe Mr. Grimm um, in response to one of the public comments about uh, fencing. Is this going to be a... Mr. Walker, yes. unfortunately, because the public hearing is closed, Sorry. we can't elicit okay. any new information at this point. Can I ask a question of staff? But certainly, yes. Sure. Um, does the proposal call for a a wall to be built or a fence to be built completely along the block on Boy North Boyer. The, the eight, what, what, how long was that block? The 2,000 foot block. Right. Um, is that going to be a, a, a community Boyer, built Boyer, wall there? Um, so by our standards within the residential single family zone, mm -hmm. uh, fences not to exceed a height of seven feet uh, may be constructed um, so long as they meet the but set back from where a sidewalk may go. And that does not require a building permit, but that, you know, still, still have to meet the standard. So that is certainly a possibility and probably something you can't expect. Again, it's, it's really the, the double frontage lot question. And um, with regards to North Boyer, as, as we've shown the staff report and as uh, Dan Preston had confirmed um, an arterial three um, probably necessitates facing houses away from that so that you don't have all those additional driveways causing additional conflict points and obstructing traffic, <coughs> particularly when you know there's railroad tracks um, not far from from where you know the uh, uh, those intersections. Um, although, you know, there is the one condition to break up the block, should you determine that uh, based on, you know, similar findings uh, that another intersection is not warranted. However, with that variance, a pedestrian, another, an additional full pedestrian path um, could be a requirement. Um, I guess to, to that point, I, I guess I was speaking to although, you know, years past, although maybe the city was not as good about following up with development uh, requirements, I'll tell you that we will certainly, it's certainly not the case today. Thank you, Aaron. Um, thanks, Jason. That was a good discussion. Do, do other commissioners or, or do any commissioners have additional questions or comments before someone wishes to put forth a motion? I have further questions and comments. Um, following up on Jason's uh, question about the wall, um, 
It is a concern for me as you drive north along Boyer, you're just, you have a view of a long plastic wall. And if you've driven around much north of Coeur d'Alene, uh, those new developments down there, the Prairie Road and Murray, they, they're just long canyons between plastic walls. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what uh, power or authority we have to request or require any alternative to that. Um, uh, the idea of breaking up that 2,000 foot block would seem to help. Are, do we have any authority or could we attach um, uh, conditions that amenities be placed in those walls like we do with downtown buildings? So every 50 feet or 100 feet, there's a bench or a tree or a planter or a public artwork. Do we have any uh, option to try to avoid North Boyer becoming a, a canyon of plastic walls? Uh, so, Aaron, I, um, guess this I will say, is for you. yeah, I will say there's a lot in the, that we don't put in conditions that are already a requirement in code, such as frontage standards, which do require tree, you know, and well, per the uh, cross section that we showed for, um, for North Boyer, for example, it does require a planting strip, and we do have frontage standards that require a uh, tree planted every 25 feet. So, with respect to in the right of way frontage standards, uh, that we do have that there for residential subdivision developments there's no requirement for benches or public art on um, commercial you know should uh, the area be commercially zoned later and a commercial development comes in um, depending on the size uh, that that does trigger other amenities such as benches or public art civic spaces there's uh, various ways to accommodate those but that would, that would only apply to subsequent rezone in the southern uh, commercial area and build out. So we have no tools specifically to avoid that uh, from the standpoint of adding conditions at least to the preliminary approval at this point. Is that what I'm hearing? I, I, mean, I may defer to Fonda here on, on how far you can go um, with, you know, and what findings would be required for additional conditions such as that. Fonda, do you want to? Sure. I think? So I, I think I'll add a couple extra comments just for clarification. So at this stage, it's been the city's obligation to take in an application for a subdivision, to review it for completeness, which has been done, and then to evaluate the specifics of the subdivision request based on city code, Idaho code, and all of the, the various bodies of law that go into making sure that this application is consistent with all of the regulations the city must comply with. That's what they've done. Then there's an obligation to utilize our own experts to say that what's been presented is either consistent with our own expert analysis or in a couple of places it is not. And so that's where the conditions come from. So the city's obligation is to say we've evaluated this application for 99% of it, it is 100% compliant with all city code, Idaho code, everything that they are required to look at. And then there's these other pieces where there's a disagreement on design standards or traffic or something along those lines. So the conditions come from the city staff with the help of their own experts, evaluation of that and a recommendation to you based on what is believed to be in the best interest of the city. This is just a preliminary plat phase. I think that Mr. Grimm did a really good job of explaining even in rebuttal that this is just preliminary. Nobody is hammering out all of the details of every specific aspect of the design standards or the requirements of this development at this time. The development agreement was provided as a courtesy to show you all of the work that has been done by both parties up until this point to at least be at a place where you can feel confident that all of these nuances are at least being considered and evaluated and discussed. And then only what is put in front of you is what is under your jurisdiction and your purview to decide. So all of that being said, at this stage with regards to 
whether or not any aspects of this application are out of compliance with city code. There have been two issues identified and those pertain to the length of those lots and the double frontage issue. With regards to the length of those lots, blocks, blocks, blocks. sorry, not lots, blocks, blocks, you can make a finding right now that you are granting a variance and allowing the length of those blocks to be maintained as presented on this preliminary plat because the variance process is within your purview. Or you can approve the plat, preliminary plat as presented with a condition that a pedestrian path as suggested be included to break up specifically that very long section that runs along North Boyer. And you can make a finding to add that condition for the pedestrian path for that breakup. As for all of any other conditional requests that would be inconsistent with city code, that's not within your purview at this point. And the, um, the condition with the pedestrian breakup that you're talking about is C, is that correct? Okay, I'm seeing enough nods. Yes. 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 Okay. And, and Fonda, Tom Riggs here, if, if, if that condition is imposed, the condition number C, does that uh, eliminate any concern with block length along Boyer? Based on the vague language of the city code, I would say yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Do you think they should have lost other, other comments or questions from the commission? Or if not, is anyone ready to make a motion? I have a question to staff. Um, so from the staff perspective, what are, what are the issues with the double frontage lots? Thank you, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Dunkel. So uh, the issues are, well, specifically with block one, would you like me to bring up the map to sure. show you? Um, uh, I will bring up my, I think I had it in my presentation, which hopefully is clear enough. I can hear double frontage. Okay, can you see that okay? Yeah. Um, okay, well the, the first, there's there's two areas where double frontage lots, you know, we, we, where we'd like a finding um, uh, with respect to the double frontage lots proposed. Uh, the first is on block one, that's the stretch along North Boyer, um, where these lots have both frontage on North Boyer and Bluegrass Avenue. Um, and per standpoint city code, um, you know, other conditions make it undesirable to meet this prohibition if you make a finding as such. Uh, based on, uh, you know, what we've heard from our uh, traffic engineers and our city engineer, um, the finding there is that essentially North Boyer is an arterial three, right? Um, and uh, that many driveways facing an arterial three could cause conflict points and obstruct traffic. Uh, the second uh, area where this double frontage applies is block two, lots one through five essentially. Um, you know, block one does have some additional uh, lots fronting Mountain View as well. And this, this has to do with the double frontage of between Mountain View and um, Water Birch Way. Um, now, the, uh, for the, for our, uh, and, and I might defer to Preston on this, but uh, per the memo supplied and included in your packet, uh, it was Mountain View was seen most appropriate as a uh, collector, uh, in which case urban area transportation plan uh, uh, It's going to become a collector. What's that? It'll become a collector with this. Yeah, that's 
Okay, yeah. that makes sense. That's my understanding. And, and again, the same logic applies to a lesser extent because it's not, you know, the, the, the um, amount of traffic on Mountain View is not quite what it would be on North Boyer and Preston. Do you, or Dan, do you want to speak to that? I think you covered it quite well, and, and Preston, I'll certainly let you follow up. Um, the current functional class of East Mountain View is a local residential street with this development. Uh, the analysis of Preston and the, and the engineers at Fair and Piers was that a collector is the most appropriate uh, designation for this moving forward. Uh, Aaron spoke to the uh, access issues. You don't typically want your driveways, and I spoke to this earlier, you typically want your driveways accessing a local, your local accessing a collector, collector accessing an arterial. Um, if we were to uh, provide access here uh, for, for these lots fronting East Mountain View, we would be in violation of that. Our driveways would be too close, and we'd be creating, uh, to Preston's point earlier, access points and, and additional conflicts where we don't want them. So does this, do the double frontage and the length of the block, those add to the reasoning to put the extra width in on Mountain View for the turn lanes or the turn lane, let's, let's say, since there is, there's, there's, there's almost no other way to go besides, you know, to go south out another way. Well, it's creating a situation where there's going to, you know, it's a captive, road it, that's one of the few places for people to exit so since there isn't an access in the middle of that long block for a, another street then the turn lane on mountain view makes total sense to me yeah and i'll point out again that the analysis did say that two lanes would be sufficient for all the future full build out of this development that was the uh, analysis by the uh, applicants, engineers, and con confirmed by our uh, their experts as well. Um, that being said, it's for all the reasons stated uh, previously that um, really considering the impacts to the neighborhood and uh, uh, that was the primary rationale for the uh, additional lane on East Mountain View. And, and that was limited uh, in our recommendation in the staff you know, potential condition from Aspen Way to East Mountain View and uh, to the east um, uh, standard, I believe it was 32 standard uh, street width for two lanes. Okay. Can I ask a question? Does yeah, yeah. The rest of North, yes. Yeah. Uh, is North Boyer in the city of San Juan, so just north of Highway 2, considered an arterial three road as well? Or is that a different designation? North Boyer. Sorry, like saying, south of large, um, south of Super One. Is that? I believe it's all an arterial. Um, uh, in terms of arterial three, um, that that designation refers to the three lane uh, configuration, okay. and okay. so different portions of of uh, Boyer may have different visions for what that section looks like, that future street section. W one of the goals of development in this town is to maintain neighborhood character to some extent and it seems like the further we get north away from downtown the further we're willing to abandon that principle and allow these sort of walled subdivisions which are more like suburbanized versions of neighborhoods they're not real neighborhoods if the rest of boyer is an arterial and we can have driveways going out onto boyer why can't we do it here seems like the whole design here is based around this idea of suburban cookie cutter neighborhood with a plastic wall around it. So by approving this today, we're really embracing that type of development on what's one of the largest properties that we can develop on in Sandpoint. Um, but in our comprehensive plan and our, everything we talk about is preserving neighborhood character. We, it seems like we could design this in a way that, pre, that preserved the neighborhood character that makes Sandpoint special in every other neighborhood in Sandpoint. There are, there are driveways going on to Division. There are driveways going on to Boyer all the way down to Highway 2. How is this road any different than those? And why did we decide to allow development? I mean, I guess we haven't allowed it yet, but um, it's too late to ask the developers, but why wasn't there just further or more effort to push the developers to design a neighborhood that was more like a neighborhood and less like a, a suburban subdivision with I mean, 
yeah i can i can certainly speak to the um uh, you know, other parts of town, Boyer Division, uh, other locations where you have uh, examples of access to uh, a higher functional class street. I would say in the vast majority of those, those are very old developments and, and growth has kind of happened around them or old uh, homes in many cases and growth has happened around them where at one point they were maybe were that more rural um, uh access and there wasn't a lot of traffic but the community's grown and continue to go around them um, our um, urban area transportation plan uh, provides some uh, minimum standards for accesses based on functional class and um, when appropriate we, we always try to meet those standards at, at a minimum um, and that is is uh, universally uh, standard engineering practice and, and planning practice is try, trying to minimize the safety and uh, congestion and issues with all those direct accesses to the divisions, to the Boyers. Um, we can't fix the old issues and those conflicts, but we can fix the new ones and try to make sure that we're not having people backing into Boyer Avenue uh, uh, when our arterials, we have to keep in mind are for moving traffic. Now, that's not to say they can't move pedestrians and bikes when they're also moving traffic, but that is the ultimate goal of an arterial is to, I think Preston spoke to it quite well earlier. It's like your arteries in your body, you know, you, you're trying to keep traffic moving and the introduction of driveways at this level of frequency would uh, absolutely hinder that. I agree, but what you're describing is an engineering problem and what we have is a community character problem. And so we slow the speed limit down to 25 and people can feel safer riding their bikes. I don't know. I mean, th this is a, a big question here and you're giving us engineering answers to what really are like community design problems or issues. And I think this, everything I hear in this community is preserving community character and I mean, Kate described it wonderfully. We're talking about building a, a plastic canyon here where instead of having a view shed out towards the Little Sand Creek and towards the Cabin and Mountains, everybody driving north is going to see a seven foot plastic wall. So I, I would just challenge everybody here to think about this a little bit differently. I mean, what if we did extend that old 20th century type neighborhood a little bit further north? I think 10 years from now, we'd all look at it and say this was a good decision. I'm, I'm this is just me uh, thinking, oh, this is deliberation, right? But I really, um, I, I don't know. I, I hear all everything you're saying, of course, cars backing out onto a busy road, but that's what the rest of Sandpoint is like. I live right on Superior, which has to be an arterial road these days, because there are, you know, I mean, it, with, the, with the curve and everything, that road is turned, it's, it's in South Sandpoint, but it gets a ton of traffic, and I still walk my dog up and down that road and feel fairly safe. And if I may also just remind the commission that in order to deny the, in order to, to say that you're not going to rec make a recommendation to move this onto council in the interest of honoring the comprehensive plan, which is to preserve community character, you have to make a solid finding that preserving community character far outweighs any of the other benefits that you might see that this development offers to the city. Second to that, you um, also have an obligation to hear fully, an applicant has a right to bring forth a preliminary plat application for the use of their land as they see fit. And we're not, as we talked about before, at the stage where you're really discussing all of the details of the, of the community. We're talking about, um, are you willing to make a recommendation to city council with these conditions that have been put before you to move forward with a preliminary plat that would allow infrastructure to begin so that these legally described parcels when the final plats approved could be created. So I just, I just caution you to think of all of those uh, liabil liability and legality issues as well. So <clears throat> I hear what you're saying and I hear what Jason says and I, I see uh, uh, we're being asked to approve something because of Boyer being a high traffic street, 
because we've made it a high traffic street because of the speed limit. So the, the double fronting lots are the reason for that, which Boyer doesn't have to be a 35 mile an hour street right there because there is more development out there now. It, it probably should be 25 miles an hour. So I, I agree with Commissioner Welker that I, I don't, I think that's where I see it, there, there being a problem is that the double fronting lots don't make sense in that neighborhood or, or what will be a neighborhood. And, and it's because of that reason that, I mean, we, we're, we're putting in another street because the other street isn't up to the standard, which is kind of ridiculous, I think. Um, and then that's more cost to the landowner too, to put in another street that, that is serving a, a, a home that is already on a street. So <clears throat> I see a problem there. And I, I think that would be reason enough to deny it. Well, I, th I think we're, we're getting pretty close to um, the point in the hearing where it'd probably be helpful if someone took a stab at a motion. I will say regarding the discussion that we just had, I drove around the subdivisions to the north of this, this proposed uh, subdivision today where there are, you know, there is the, the plastic canyon effect to some degree north of this and there are uh, double frontage lots, but at the same, and which, uh, you know, I agree with a lot of those sentiments, but at the same time, getting back out onto Boyer today from some of those subdivisions to the north was a real problem. And I think it's, we're gonna really ex ex exacerbate it if we start allowing driveways and the like to, um, provide, you know, create more points of conflict on Boyer. Boyer is very heavily traveled. It's, um, I don't know, I, I, I really hesitate to add more points of con conflict on it. Chairman Riggs, if, if I may, I, I, I think it's important to point out that uh, in all this discussion, the Urban Area Transportation Plan was adopted by City Council and that provides minimum standards for uh, spacing, access, approach and intersection spacing on uh, arterials, collectors, local streets, et cetera. Um, the functional class is driven, uh, dictated more by the average daily traffic than the speed limit. So lowering the speed limit isn't gonna change the functional class of Boyer. Um, so, with those standards in place, uh, we would be violating those standards to provide driveways accessing, uh, well, uh, in this case, certainly uh, Baldy, or excuse me, um, Boyer, but uh, uh, also East Mountain View with the analysis of our experts that uh, that is uh, to be a collector uh, as opposed to a current uh, local street. Mr. Chair, I, yes. Uh, you know, one small concession, at least on North Boyer, that you may consider, and I would, you know, I'm fond of, let's see if this would be appropriate, but based on the finding of preserving community character, um, you could require for this particular subdivision any fences along Boyer, you need a construction of wood. You know, if, and I know you all realize that it's not, it, it's not really the, you know, plastic canyon. It's still, the canyon effect would still be there. But if that's a small concession, uh, that it's just something to throw out there. With respect to Mountain View, um, or North Boyer for that matter, uh, I, I suppose if, you want to, if, if you're hesitant to make a finding for double, for the allowance of double frontage lots, that would really create a pretty significant redesign of the preliminary plat and 
uh, arguably another public hearing. Well, and, and, you know, that option two that I showed you before, uh, you can render a decision in 40 days from now. That is enough to advertise for a public hearing. I'm not necessarily advocating that you do so. I'm just giving you some options. But to reemphasize, if there's any indication there's going to be a motion to make a recommendation to move this preliminary plat to city council for approval, you do need to make a formal finding that you acknowledge the double frontage lots and you find that the character and condition of this particular development makes it impossible for them to avoid basically the double frontage lots. Thanks, Fonda. Is anyone re ready to make a motion? Is it acceptable to make a motion to postpone or table the discussion? Yes. Yes, yes that's possible. Would, would, that, uh, would that extend this hearing? So if you just continued essentially postpone the decision like two weeks from now, um, no new information, no new designs can be provided without an opportunity for another public hearing. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, your, the other alternative to postponing a decision is to advertise a second public hearing in which you want to, we, you know, with a directive to provide a design alternative, for example, eliminating double frontage lots where feasible. It just, that's potentially an option. Can I, you, go ahead. Yeah, I just have a quick clarifying, clarifying question. So double frontage lots are in violation of city code. So therefore, we need to grant a variance in order to. No, sir. It's. Can you clarify the legal language around double frontage lots? I'll, I'll bring it up. Put it back up. The double frontage lots are prohibited unless you make a finding that one of three circumstances or situations exist. Could, could you read those out loud for us, Aaron? I cannot. Yeah. Read that from uh, here, sorry. Um, what are the three circumstances? So. Uh, section 1016A7, double frontage lots are those created by either public or private streets, but not by driveways or alleys. Double frontage lots shall be prohibited except where unusual topography, more integrated street plan, or other conditions make it undesirable to meet this prohibition. And, and in this case, is it a, a more integrated street plan? I heard Dan describe that having um, lots fronting Boyer would be in violation of another uh, code design code. So in other words, double frontage lots are necessary or because having a single frontage on North Boyer would be in violation of another code. Is that correct? Rather than a single frontage, I would say um, direct access from lots to Boyer would be in violation of the minimum driveway spacing requirements of the urban area transportation plan he adopted. So I, I would say it's probably more the other conditions make it undesirable uh, category than it is an integrated street plan. Uh, Which there is an integrated street plan, I, I, would, I, I would say, within this development. And uh, the essentially not having access, uh, you know, driveway access onto North Warrior and Art Artillery Artillery three by its nature sort of mandates a double frontage lot. Mm -hmm. I think the K, a, a finding is is you know certainly uh, much more you know not a stretch uh, in this case for North Boyer in, you know based on at least the uh, you know our the um, TIA, our, our uh, hired consultants, traffic engineering consultants, and Dan here, um, Mountain View. It's not as strong of a case because it's not as, uh, you know, the classification is not um, quite what it is on arterial, you know, <coughs> on North Boyer, but there's still, uh, you can certainly, I think, based on the uh, discussion tonight, you know, consultants. Uh, analysis, you can make a finding for Mountain View as well. Yeah, absolutely. Would the would the landowner be able to see more lots 
on the property if they did use Boyer as a frontage? I, I don't know. We, we have to, you'd have to go back to the drawing board, frankly. And that would certainly want to look at a, a new traffic study if we're changing that significantly. Well, again, I want to close the question whether anyone feels they're ready to make a motion of any sort. Uh, uh, so, you know, if there's a middle ground. I um, say one percent. One percent. Okay. Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, yes. go ahead. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, uh, can we have a five minute recess? Everybody chance to collect their thoughts. Uh, and please, the, no discussion with any uh, member of the public or applicant during that time for ex parte content, or you know, we've closed the public hearing, but if that's acceptable to you, Mr. Chair and the commission. Uh, that that that's acceptable to me if it uh, will help move things along it's probably a good idea so we'll take a five minute intermission here and then reconvene we are live all right so we've had a, we've had an intermission for a few minutes has that clarified anybody's mind as to where you want to go I'm going to make a motion to postpone to think about it further and hopefully be able to talk to our legal counsel. Uh, to a time certain? Excuse me? To a time certain? Uh, a specific date, the next regularly scheduled uh, planning commission meeting? I would think for that, example? I would think that would be adequate. Okay. And I would so second that. So we have a motion and a second to continue this hearing to the next scheduled. Mr. Mr. Chair, what? Mr. Chair, point of clarification, you're continuing the deliberations. The hearing has been closed. Oh, good, good point. Good point. Yeah, Conti we would continue the, the deliberations on this closed hearing at our next regularly scheduled planning commission meeting. And when would that be, Aaron? October 6, 5.30 p.m. October 6, 5.30 p.m. And Aaron, can you clarify, or Fauna, can you clarify who we are allowed to talk to about this between now and then? Uh, staff only, and um, any uh, consultants uh, the city has um, contracted with in association with the project. Mm. So, so maybe we, not, we, not each other. But not, not each, each other. other. Yeah, <laughs> OK. Thank you, Fonda. Yeah. <laughs> so we could probably get that to us in an email. So there's. You individually, we can you know, give you all the time that you need um, with any consultants. Um, as far as any other communiques, I guess. email from staff to the entire planning commission. Uh, we can't really add any new information at this point. Um, we can elaborate on the facts presented in the hearing, which I think has been pretty exhaustive. If there are new facts, that would trigger a whole nother public hearing. Arguably, given the time frame outlined in our code, let me bring that up. Um, You have 40 days and continued deliberations. Uh -uh. 
um, it, regardless, at, in October 6th, you're going to have to forward something to City Council. A recommendation. Right. Good. Okay. Well, those are good clarifications. Um, we have a motion and a second to continue the deliberations on this matter to the meeting of October 6th at 5.30 p.m. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any no. are there any nays? Yeah, no. And who is that? Mr. Dunkel. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Dunkel. So it appears that that motion has passed um, six to one to continue this matter to October sixth at five thirty PM. Aaron, does that sound right? That sounds good. Okay. I believe that brings us to the end of our agenda. Is, it, is there any other uh, business to be conducted? Uh, no, sir, not from staff. Okay, is there a motion? Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. A motion, a second. second, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That, that passes. That uh, concludes our uh, meeting tonight. Thank you.